Oh, that's that. <laughs> Cannot hear you. Oh, you can't hear me. Can't hear you. No. Hmm. Oh, wait, hold on. Can't hear me. Yeah, that's my bad. Oh, okay. All right. What did you say when I said I'm OCD? I said uh, that light is still bothering you. <laughs> yeah. Wait, why? Is <laughs> Who keeps messing with the camera? Uh, with my camera? No, ours. Oh. Oh, I was wondering if Aaron was in there this morning. Good morning, everybody. Do we got a minute to go ahead and do my intro? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Bigger, bigger, better, better, older, older. The cold hard truth is taking talk to the next level. Right here on Bobo 89.1 FM, Cayman's Community Radio. We are still spilling the tea and committed to being part of the change that Cayman so desperately needs. Join Sandy Hill weekdays from 7.30 a.m. for Premier Access, Cayman Voices, Truthful Thursdays, and much more. Cayman's number one talk show is now bigger, bigger, better, better, bolder, older, and more than talk. Getting results with hot topics, consumer reports, court exposés, and more. I've come to set the record straight. I've come to shine the light on you Let me introduce myself I am the cold heart truth Now, from the CMR studio in Grand Cayman Live, direct It's the cold hard truth Now, now Join the conversation on 345-936 2626. That number again is 345 936 2626. Stand by. Big news. I have some important news for you. Interesting news. It's Blake and Darren's Spilling the Tea with Sandy. K-Man's top news headlines of the day from CMR. Good morning, Sandy. Happy Friday. Hey, Blake and Aaron. Happy Friday. Can't believe it. I know. It's the last Friday of January. Uh, totally crazy. crazy. Yes, yeah. indeed. So what? Mr. McKeever Bush is stressed out ahead of his criminal rulings. He's got two files, um, two matters with the police that are currently under investigation. So we checked in with them to see how those matters are going. And we understand that they're progressing. Um, he is um, supposed to be providing opportunities for the police to interview him ahead of their submissions to the DPP's office. So in the first investigation, which is the incident at the Ritz-Carlton that happened late last year, um, the file is with the DPP and the police are waiting one final piece of information before the office of the director of public prosecution can actually make a legal ruling. Sure. It's anticipated that that final piece of information will be available this week. And so we'll see how long it takes for them to make the ruling from there. The second investigation, which has come to light um, since that one is in relation to decades old sexual assault allegation and that is said to be progressing satisfactorily. And Bush's attorneys have been engaging with investigators who have been reviewing disclosure materials provided by the RCIPS. Interesting. And, um, you know, they have said that he is committed to doing interviews. However, the 68 year old who just celebrated his birthday this past weekend um, has been having his personal assistant send out these messages saying that he's stressed out and he should be avoiding anything that causes him stress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, is this, is there a correlation between um, this and him heading to? Well, well, yeah, a lot of people suspect that they're trying to make a correlation. Like, oh, he's so stressed out. He can't do an interview with the police. So we'll see. Well, this is, mm. you know, this is, no one should be uh, above the law. Yeah. Even if you're stressed out, that's why you don't do certain things. Yeah. Anyway, um, a major healthcare fraud has been uncovered in Florida. 
where more than 7,600 fake nursing degree diplomas were issued over a period of some five years. The students paid a total of $114 million to get fake degrees between 2016 and 2021, uh, with 2,400 of the 7,600 students eventually passing their licensing exams. This is kind of crazy, hmm. to be honest, because some of those they're now saying has resulted in uh, people actually being injured. So well, the yeah, U.S. Not, attorney... The nurse, only, yeah. The is only it only nurse play one, or doctor? Nurse. Okay. Nurses. Same. If if you, they they, you only they play put doctor, needles in me. I don't want that. Yeah. You only play one on TV. It doesn't make okay. you a real doctor. I don't know. If you've been on Grey's Anatomy for all 19, 20 years, maybe. You probably yeah. learned some stuff. <laughs> so the fake diplomas and transcripts qualified these individuals who purchased them to sit for the National Nursing Board exam. And if they pass, they were actually able to obtain licenses and jobs in various states. So according to the Miami Herald, some of them um, were from the from South Florida's Haitian American community, including some with legitimate LPN licenses. So this is this is quite serious when you think about it. And so they can trace everywhere that they're working. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, so they, they've been in critical roles treating patients. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to mm -hmm. talk about a local story really quick. I don't know yes. what you have on your agenda there, but so. Um, we found I had family on the the BA last night that mm. got canceled, mm -hmm. and so I saw that you posted up as well mm -hmm. that the crew that was supposed to get on and fly the, the next leg over got food poisoning. Yes. So, is that confirmed, or were they out partying at mm -hmm. the casino? What did they? Um, well, I mean, a BA hasn't said anything, so I guess technically it hasn't been confirmed by them. Mm. But our sources have said that. Um, a crew member experienced some food poisoning, but they found it strange because they're like, don't they have, you know, one or two additional crew members that could have um, assisted? So, well, no, I don't know, but the, the delay, have you heard when the flight will be? Are they going to wait like an entire? No, no, they'll um, be on today's flight. They're going today. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but not until this evening. Though. Yeah, so, they'll be on the, the four o'clock flight today. Wow. So at least they get a day in the Bahamas, but. Again. I'm wondering if you if you could if you do. Would... They put they don't put them up at Atlantis though. No. So. No, we are you kidding? That's what I, <laughs> that's what I thought. VA. We wish. Um, yeah, but that that's as much as we had as well. Mm. Um. So yeah, it's unfortunate, but you know, travel has become such a nightmare now. I tell you. Yeah, it used to be fun. Yeah. When you look back at the old pictures of airports and flying, mm -hmm. everybody's in a suit and and a nice dress. Or, yep. some, or, or you know, they're dressed up. Not, yes, you know what not I mean? anymore. Yeah. But it's, but also it, it's the airlines that have made it not fun. It's not yeah. comfortable between those. They, they've given us less room, so no one wants to be in like, like a suit. Yeah, because it's uncomfortable. Correct. You know. Absolutely. So anyway, I mean, it used to be that used to be for me the the funnest part of going somewhere is mm -hmm. is being on the, up. No, being on the plane, oh, flying. It's you know, it. you know, I enjoy flying. Yeah. But now mm -hmm. I just want to get it over with. Yeah, it's yeah. Vacation. We need it now. Mm -hmm. All right. So I know you're gonna jump on Bobo 89.1 FM. What do you yes. got on your show this morning, really quick? We are live. Well, we're gonna be talking a little bit about the McKeeva situation, some more. We'll dissect that. Mm -hmm. We're also gonna be talking about scammers. Um, there's quite a few new cases that have come up that people really need to be aware of, uh, including one with a local vendor charging thousands of dollars in merchandise to people's um, credits and debit cards. Um, and then we have a segment of Cayman Voices today as well, which is pretty exciting, an uh, interview with Mr. Andrew Eden. All right. Great. We will uh, see you Monday, so have a great weekend, all right? Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Hope you too. Aaron. All right, folks. Buenos dias. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Hope that you are well. Um, let me just grab my show links. Good morning to Miss Vernita. Ervalyn is here, Diamond Princess. Wee oui, Wee oui, Alejandro is bright and early. So let me grab YouTube here, first. Wee oui, Wee oui, Alejandro. Okay. And then, hold on one second. Let me see. Uh, let me see. Mm hmm. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so that's some of what we've got coming up for you in just a minute here this morning. 
So I'm actually going to take an LFT test this morning as well. I got, I got all my components here. I am going to do it. Mm -hmm. All right. Give me one quick second. Everybody's good. Happy Friday. Last Friday of January already. Wow. Is it just me or is time speeding up? I think it might technically be speeding up as well, but I tell you what. Hold on one second here. It seems to be moving a lot quicker than it used to. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me see here. Now we are well on our way. So good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Yes, I've got to do an LFT. <laughs> Ooh, Lord, life. It's like life pre-COVID, life after covid uh, we will always remember and it will never be the same again. I was kind of hoping that COVID would have been like, um, what, what's the other one called? Oh, I forgot my, uh, oh gosh, listen, I forgot the, um, the actual swab part of it. I've got everything else for the kit. All right. Give me one second. I'm going to do it. We're going to get some live results here. Just give me one second. Hold on, hold on. Beautiful people. Wagwan, Wagwan. Anybody else? Anyone? I shouldn't say anybody else because I've had it already, but is there anybody out there who still remains COVID free? Mm -hmm. um, I felt like last November or October when I finally got it, I was like, oh my God. I was the last of the Mohicans. People are like, COVID? You're still getting COVID? People are still getting COVID? And I'm like, yeah. Not only are people still getting COVID, but during the winter months, there was a resurgence of COVID. Um, definitely in the U.S., more people are getting it. I ran and got my vaccine uh, booster. Uh, someone says, what a coincidence. I'm doing my LFT now, too. Mine will be negative. They're praying negativity, <laughs> praying that it's negative. Uh, pray yours is as well. Honey, cha, let's see. Um, one, two... How many drops are we supposed to do? I just give it enough of a sample. All right. Let's see. So, um, yes, there's been a resurgence of COVID cases in the U.S., so much so that hospitals were getting inundated again. Um, wow, crazy. So, you know, you travel, you got to be careful. There's been a lot of cases in New York. When I was there, talking to Marlon's cousin, she's like, um, she's actually in the security business. So she provides security for high-end clientele, mostly from the Middle East. And she was saying that a lot of them are still not returning to the U.S. because they're afraid of COVID. <laughs> so they are uh, literally uh -huh, refusing to um, travel to New York in particular because New York still has a relatively high uh, instances of COVID. So I'm like, really? Uh, listen, China has been struggling. Poor China. They're they're a hot mess. They um, are struggling with, first, they were like zero COVID policy, where they're trying to keep the numbers to zero, which, as you know, is impossible. And then um, they were like kind of opening up, and they had this huge peak. And when they had the peak over the holidays, so many people are dying. But, you know, China has a reputation for really, really hiding things. And so um, you can't believe what China tells you, honestly. 
But we do know there's really, really strong evidence that uh, the first week of January, um, well, actually into December, they had so many critically ill people uh, in um, their hospitals and people were just dropping dead, um, you know, because they had them locked up forever, that um, it, it was just horrible. So they ended their zero COVID policy in early December. And last week, a senior health official said that 80% of the people had been inf infected in this wave. <laughs> Eight, let, let that sink in for a second. What's the population of China? 80% after they came out of their COVID, zero COVID policy, 80% of the people had been infected in the December wave, it says. Lord Jesus, these people are crazy. Um, you know, nobody seems to know where their figures come from because, again, they, they, they're they very shady with numbers. So um, just a hot mess. And then, according to data, 128,000 people were critically ill in Chinese hospitals as of January the 5th, which was the highest number reached during this particular wave. And it peaked inside hospitals over the Western New Year with almost 10,000 new critically ill cases a day from December the 27th through to January the 3rd. According to them, and this is where you can't believe the Chinese government, by the 23rd of January, the total number of critically ill cases had dropped by 72% to some 36,000. Mm, I'm not inclined to believe that, none at all. But they've really been struggling, man. They've just not figured it out at all. So, um, I don't know. Mm -mm. It's a hot mess. Uh, yeah. So they, they, they've just missed the boat entirely. But now they have their Lunar New Year that's coming up with a lot of people uh, preparing for that and getting all ready for the festivities. So I decided to COVID test because I do have a COVID positive person in my household. Gianna has it. So she's fallen again. Um so she's isolated to what we have designated as the COVID room, which is the master suite. So now I'm scrunched up in, in a little bed <laughs> trying to get some sleep at night. Uh, when I say a little bed, it's still a queen size bed. But, you know, when you're when you're used to flopping out and rolling a couple times in a bigger bed, it's kind of hard. Uh -huh. So um, I've been doing something lately. You know, I'm all about lifelong learning. Y'all know this already. And um, I have been watching a series called History. Hold on. Let me tell you what it's called. Um, history. Oh, good grief. What's it called now? Um, they're really, really good. It is called um, Absolute History. And it's um, like a streaming thing that you can get with the History Channel. And so I've been learning all about um, Versailles in France, how, you know, the building of it with um, King Louis the Fourteenth, and then really the demise of it by the time they got around to King Louis the Sixteenth. And boy, I tell you what, it is so interesting, the things that you learn. Um, I don't really know a whole lot about French history, to be honest. American history, I've probably forgotten a lot of that from what they taught you when you were in school. But I actually never knew that the French um, actually were, um, I'm going to grab this link. So I want to share some of this with you guys. I didn't actually know that the French were actually sort of pivotal at, uh, in ensuring that the Americans won their revolution, uh, their independence against the UK. So how the story goes is that France wanted to go to war with the UK. Apparently, they've not always been friends. But they um, decided that they couldn't afford it. And so they didn't want to do like a direct attack on the UK like that. So what they did instead was they actually um, decided to support the colony, the Americans, right? And they sent them all sorts of um, ammunition and stuff like that to uh, really help. So the, his wife would have been Marie Antoinette. And they got married. She was only 14 years old when they got married. 
he was 15 years old. And um, there's a really interesting story about the two of them. And I'll tell you, it's an adult theme story, but I'll tell you here in a second. But yeah, so um, they, again, you know, a lot of these marriages were marriages of convenience. So she was, um, what country was she from again? But anyway, they married her off because um, they wanted uh, to, to bridge the gap between Austria. She was Austrian. So they, she was born um, an Archduchess of Austria. So they wanted to bridge the gap between Austria and France. And one of the ways in which they do it was they married people together, right? And that was a, a sign of, okay, friendship, solidarity, whatever. Now, the interesting thing about her is in the end, she turned out to be the demise of, um, and when I say she turned out, as, as is typical, um, they will blame the woman um, for a lot of things that are wrong in the country and it actually has nothing to do with her. But it turns out that he was a very indecisive prince. <laughs> the one thing that uh, in my you know readings uh, of the whole thing is, man, this poor guy was so indecisive that really I think in the end that was um, his downfall. He just couldn't. He had three or four, um, like, um, uh, financial ministers, the equivalent of that. And they kept giving him advice, giving him advice. And you know what the advice was? The advice was to tax the rich. You know, they were like, listen, we're broke. We don't have any money. Um, all these issues tax the rich because the rich, as usual, weren't paying anything. They weren't paying any taxes whatsoever. And he, they were like, every minister that came in um, gave him the hard line. So, some initially didn't say it. And eventually what they came to was like, listen, you have got to tax the rich. They're not paying uh, any taxes. A lot of them were living at Versailles. There was this whole thing where he had his court there. A lot of them were living there. Some were relatives. Some were just, you know, the elite um, arist arist uh, aristocrats of the day. And they lived in excess and they had no idea what was ha happening to the average person. But poor Louis the 16th, every time he tried to bring it to them, of course, the elite were, were also the ones who were making the decisions, which is so crazy. They um, refused. The channel is part of the History Hits gonna, Network. Bring everything from the this, jobs of Tudor England to the diaries of Queen Victoria. Not only that. All right. So I'm, I'm going to share some of this with you guys. It's so fascinating. But. Basically, um, they refused to tax themselves, which you could understand. But Louis XVI was actually trying to push for, and he made some decisions that would have been like the first kind of democratic decisions. But boy, the aristocrats were just not ready. They fought and they fought and they fought. And finally, when the people had enough, they came for him and his wife. And you know what happens when they come for you? Your head's going to get chopped off. And um, it was so sad, but before they did that, because at some point he was actually a little bit popular with the average, the commoners, uh, before they came for him, they um, were doing a smear campaign. And it's hard to think about what a smear campaign would be like, but let me tell y'all, y'all be sitting here talking about, oh, this paper, uh, Ma Road, the Daily Mail, blah, blah, honey, child, we are nothing compared to what they would publish back in the day in these pamphlets. I'm going to show you guys here in a second. But I want to find some of the clips, because, clips um, here in this segment because there's a couple of things that I didn't know that really surprised me. So apparently, you know, when you became king and you got married, your first order of business was produce an heir to the throne. Well, they said that it took them some um, seven or eight years before his wife got pregnant. And really, they blamed him and not her for that. And I'll, I'm going to let you, I'll share the link and I'm going to let you guys go and, and re listen for yourself why that was. It seems like he actually didn't know what to do. Don't ask. <laughs> so they spent some time talking about how is it that he didn't know what to do, but apparently that, that was the case. I don't, I don't know folks, but let me, let me find a snippet here. Like everyone else for the first time in their lives. And they didn't like that idea at all. Mm -hmm. Versailles becoming an increasingly isolated little world. Listen to this. Nobles who are living uselessly 
spending money, relying on court pensions, utterly oblivious to the political issues in France. Certain taxes uh, were not paid by the nobility, notably the Thai um, uh, poll tax simply wasn't paid by anyone. Now, Louis mm -hmm. XVI thought this was wrong and aimed to end it. Yes, he was trying. But Turgot's reforms had to be accepted by France's highest law court, the Parlement. Its members, like most of Louis's own governing council, were outraged by his ideas. Imagine. If the Parliament refuses to enregistre these new laws, we will have to enregistre by force. By force! So they were saying here, they're translating, that they would force the, um, they'd force the changes through. And they're like, force? What do you think? Um, Trugot, whatever his name was, he was the first minister, financial minister. They got rid of him in a hurry. And they're like, force it through? Are you crazy? You can't force that through on us. We're special. We're the elite. I'm improvising here, trust me. Pas donc invincible, Monsieur Turgot. On croirait entendre un de ces philosophes dont vous êtes si proche. Opposition to Turgot's reforms came from within the council, very conservative men who felt mm -hmm. that the sorts of things that uh, Turgot was proposing threatened the traditional structure of society, in which uh, nobles and clergy held a privileged position relative to the rest of society. Reposition rapporterait. Vous allez trop loin, messieurs. We cannot afford to anger the clergy and the nob nobility at once. Oh my gosh, heaven forbid. We upset rich people. <laughs> and unfortunately, he said, oh, I'm going to read it and tell you all my feelings, blah, blah, blah. So unfortunately for him, he and just so he did had, not if you have... will, stirred up the hornet's nest of vested interest. Yeah. Poor thing. Queen Marie Antoinette loved to dance and gamble in the most fashionable mm. Parisian salons, mm -hmm. where she heard all the gossip against Turgot. Votre nuit fut-elle bonne? <laughs> La fête était magnifique, oui. <laughs> mm -hmm. Je meurs de sommeil, il me tarde de me coucher. So poor them, um, they lived a life of excess without a doubt. You know, they were clueless about how the average person uh, lived. And most of his time he spent, he didn't even leave Versailles. He was so isolated from the people. But he went through, I think it was a total of like four financial ministers and they just could never get it together. But I thought the most interesting thing was when they supported the Americans um, in the revolution. I'm gonna try to find that snippet here. Um, and they actually invited Benjamin Franklin to come to visit France and to visit uh, Prince, uh, um, King Louis the 16th, which I thought was very, very interesting. So um, eventually they did go to war with England. It was very, very costly. And by the way, the Americans who they anticipated would pay them back <laughs> in typical American fashion, they pulled a fast one on them and they said, nope, we're not going to pay you back. And not only are we not going to pay, hold on, let me find it for you. Cause this is so interesting. Hold on, let me find that. Having financial problems finds it terrifically advantageous because it means that he places his personal credit to the oh, hold on, let me see. off to help the Americans fight yes. off the British attempt. All right, hold on, Great. this is where. Mm -hmm. Using a certain amount of... Ah, uh, here we go. Louis XVI would like nothing more than to attack the old enemy. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there's a problem. If they do that, are they not supporting insurgents? And indeed insurgents, many of whom were Republicans and avowed Republicans at that. And so it's difficult. And so to begin with, the, they take a kind of a middle course. Monsieur Vergen. Nous ne pouvons fournir armes et munitions insurgées, mais nous pouvons leur donner les moyens d'en acheter à des personnes privées. Le gouvernement n'apparaîtra en rien. So, so this is what they were saying, because some of it's obviously in French. They were basically saying that um, they would support the rebels in the who were, or were considered rebels at the time uh, in the UK, uh, in the US, sorry. And it said, we may not supply arms and ammunition to the insurgents, um, but we can provide them with the means to buy them from private individuals so that the government will not be visible at all. So governments have always played games with the people, have they not? After all, governments are made up of people. Let's just be very, very honest here. And the quality of what you get 
is, you know, and, and back in this day, they, they wanted to go after England directly, but they couldn't afford a war and they couldn't afford the optics of what that would look like. So what they did instead uh, was support the insurgents. But of course, they're thinking, my God, if we support insurgents in America, what happens when the insurgents in France decide to rise up? You know, it, it's the same, like, prince from a uh, principled perspective, supporting insurgents was not seen really as a good thing. So they were trying to do it kind of from behind the scenes. So have a listen to how that played out for them. Louis approved the aid, but insisted that everything was done in secret. Mm -hmm. Using a certain amount of covert skullduggery, weapons and arms are sent off to help the Americans fight off the British attempt to reconquer the rebellious colonies. Mm -hmm. Imagine. All this assistance to America cost the French government a fortune, mm -hmm. money it simply did not have. Louis turned to his new finance minister, and Necker arranged emergency loans from his banking mm -hmm. friends. Government the world's broke. first democratic revolution was being financed by one of the least democratic nations in Europe. <laughs> Hold on. Let, let, let's hear that again. Let, let's listen to that one more time. To attempt to reconquer the rebellious colonies. Let's hear that once more. That is so funny. All this assistance to America cost the French government a fortune, money it simply did not have. Mm -hmm. Louis turned to his new finance minister, and Necker arranged emergency loans from his banking friends. The world's first democratic revolution was being financed by one of the least democratic nations in Europe. Imagine. A fact that troubled Louis himself. The fact was not lost on him. So he says, American insurgents are not just flying the flag of revolt against England, right? Their goals are opposed to the interests of the monarchy. And of course, the concept of the monarchy a monarchy which for, for the French, he was still very much a part of. So he was conflicted. Like, yes, we're helping these insurgents, but you know what they stand for is what we don't want. We don't want people thinking that they can rise up against the monarchy because he's Louis the Sixteenth. Louis the Fourteenth was a very different ruler than him. And Louis the Fourteenth was who built Versailles, this uh, just immaculate, opulent, um, over the top, um, palace, right? The 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 best in all of Europe wanted it to be the best in the world, the whole nine yards. No expense was spared. And um, Louis the Fourteenth, quite interestingly enough, ruled very affirmatively. He was not indecisive at all. Uh, so his reign was very very different than Louis the Sixteenth, who couldn't make up his mind. He was so indecisive that in the end he actually had the equivalent of a nervous breakdown, which was so interesting, but continue to listen. So he says, their goals are opposed to the interests of the monarchy. For it is not their intention, should they be victorious, to create a republic. So again, the concept of people being free in creating a republic or a democratic society is something that at that time, the monarch still was like, oh, we don't want that to happen. And then this one goes on, says, America is too far away, uh, sire, for us to fear contagion. You know, so, I mean, this is so interesting because, of course, revolutions are contagious. People hear about a revolution happening somewhere else. They galvanize and they think, wow, if that country can do it, we too can, can stand up for our rights, right? And, and here they are talking about you know, this concept of the fear of contagion, like, oh, America's too far away. You know, back then they didn't have the internet, they had no TV. So they're hoping that the word of what was happening in America would not have even gotten to the average person on the street in France. And it probably didn't, to be quite honest. Hey, what he says, now this is so, so, so critical. Ideas travel too. Huh? Isn't that amazing? Even back then, ideas travel too, and they sure do. Mm, mm, mm. In the end, he de gave it. La guerre, non. So he said, as far as declaring war on England guerre, is concerned, I cannot bring résoudre. myself to do it. Mais nous devons nous but we must prepare défensive. for a defensive war. Nous devons rénover and, and we must renovate and increase our fleet. Pour the money that is needed. 
Ce sera donc l'empereur. Will be borrowed by Monsieur Mr. Nectar, or whatever his name is, Nectar. Yes. Good morning, Miss Morna. After three years, years of war, Louis' two investment years. in the American Revolution seemed to pay off when the rebels scored their first great victory at the Battle of Saratoga. He decided that the moment had come to support America publicly and go to war with Britain. He threw a huge party at Versailles to welcome one of the men who drafted America's Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Franklin. Louis and the nobles of Versailles didn't care that Franklin was a Democrat who did not believe in the rule of kings and princes. What appealed to them was the chance to do down a country they hated so much that they wore its image on their backsides. Oh my the gosh, look at this. At Versailles love Franklin. They were making fun of England by taking, like I said, they were so salty back in the day. Like, it's just so amusing, right, to see this stuff played out. But they actually took printed little pamphlets of England and wore it on their backside as a way to insult the English. <laughs> they inv invited Benjamin Franklin, um, you know, and it's just so it's so interesting. So uh, listen to what happens next. Um, because he was a suit like they were. They, they dressed up as shepherdesses. He dressed up as a fur trapper. Même si aujourd'hui nous vivons dans la nuit, nous avons allumé assez de bougies. So um, it says here, um, e even if, let me just read to you what he says here. Um, even if we live in darkness today, we have lit enough candles um, to dance while we wait for a new day to break. Huh? Interesting. When Benjamin and they're all Franklin clapping. arrived yes, in France, yes, he yes. was an absolute celebrity. There was a real sort of frenzy really a franklin mania almost uh, as everybody wants to be seen uh, mm -hmm. with the great man he snatched the lightning from the sky these are people just patting themselves in the back i want y'all to make the correlation between what happens in this day and age um and the and the scepter from the tyrants i mean it's like you know, they, they live in this world of their own creation that is so incredibly interesting. But he interesting. wants to be seen uh, with the great man. Uh, Prestige and power and money. And, mm -hmm. The war may have been successful, but it was costing more every year that it dragged on. <clears throat> Finance Minister Necker had already borrowed up to the hilt mm -mm. and was now struggling to get a grip on royal spending. Il faut aussi réduire encore he says we must continue to reduce the, the royal du household's du rate of expenditure. Um, le prix, si nous voulons, hein? That is the price if you wish to impose savings on all Imposer of your courtiers. Yeah. Ensemble de vos courtisans. Uh -huh. War is increasingly expensive and the French political system is not set up to impose taxes on the people who are best able to pay them. So the fundamental problem of the French state is how do you tax the rich? Le seul moyen pour restaurer les finances publiques serait de rendre l'impôt obligatoire pour tous, mais vraiment pour tous. So he says here, and this is very, very interesting, that um, essentially they have got to be prepared to tax everyone. And he says, when I say everyone, I mean everyone. So including the rich and especially the rich because they were paying nothing and they were the ones who were actually, um, he says the only way of restoring public finances is to make taxes, um, hold on one second, mandatory for everyone. And I mean everyone. And so once again, the pressures, he said, that would be that would set the clergy and the nobility against us. Of course, they knew once again that this is gonna be a hard sell for the people who would actually approve it. Now, this go around... Um, had, had pretty much exhausted the possibility uh, I'm gonna of I'm going to show you guys here in a second. He was aware no more that borrowing. it was necessary to raise taxes. Pension, gratification et autres. Necker published plans to get rid of the unnecessary but lucrative jobs enjoyed by the courtiers at Versailles. Uh -huh. But even the suggestion of reining in the privileges of the nobles mm. set off a familiar mm. argument. Imagine. Écoutez la suite. Toute exception. 
So listen, now they're, they're reading the proposals, the pamphlet, making fun of it, right? Here they are eating in excess, living in excess. And it says any exception Toute and any favor devient... sooner or later becomes an injustice towards society. I want you all to listen to the exact same arguments, right? That are being made in this day and age. Um, because as always, these are the arguments. These are the arguments of the nobility, of the people who, you know, grew up with this golden spoon in their mouth. They were simply not ready for times to change. And so it says here, uh, this is what they were reading in the pamphlet. And th the funny thing is these were democratic ideas, maybe a little bit before their time. The nobility were not ready to accept these things. The people in power not, were not ready to accept it. And ultimately, it took the common man on the street who was having a bread famine to say enough is enough. Um, and, you know, they, they pushed their way forward. And the end result was revolution. So they're making fun of what they're reading. And these are some of the very principles that democracies are built on today. So um, this is what she reads in the pamphlet. She says, any exception and any favor right, sooner or later becomes an injustice towards society. So you know how we've been talking about, we bring this up this week and we've been talking about it. We don't need government to show favoritism to anybody. So any injustice or any favor sooner or later becomes an injustice towards society. So the concept of democracy is that we should all be on a playing, on an even playing field. So yeah, I mean, Sue, this happened hundreds of years ago, but the relevance of it in this day and age is still very much present even now. And so this is why it is important. This is why I love history and I love to learn because the truth of the matter is we are doomed as human beings, quite frankly, um, to repeat history. It, it, it's almost like we cannot help ourselves. And the issue with it, is if we repeat history without having learned a single thing, uh, you know what's going to happen. Nothing changes. Good morning, caller. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for your history lesson. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> I'm, I'm just sharing a little bit of what I've been immer immersed in, in at the moment. But let them bread, let them eat cake. Mm. Oh, you know what? By the way, they... they, they um, have attributed that quote to uh, um, Madame Marie Antoinette, and she actually never uh -huh. said it. We're, we're going to get to that part in the story. Indulge me just a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So fascinating. All yeah. right, darling. Now, poor Jonathan, he's like, why are we having a review here? What are we doing? Movie reviews? Jonathan, I want you to sit back and listen, because my point remains this. We are capable as human beings of learning but only if we truly understand the lessons that history should have taught us. But as is typical with human nature, we forget. Not only do we forget for those of us who know the lessons, those of us who don't know the lessons are often not willing to learn. This is problematic. And I'm gonna show you in a minute, when you think about the, um, the revolution, right? The American Revolution, uh, by the way, what the Americans did was they didn't pay France back, right? Which is interesting. Not only did they not pay France back for all the money and the help that they got, but they turned around and decided that they were going to continue working with England to trade. So France did not even require, acquire a trade partner. Mm, however, mm. I want you to think now about the relationship that the U.S. and France had forged at such an early stage. And imagine in your minds how that would later impact what the French were allowed to do in Haiti. These are, these are more recent and relevant times and recent and relevant facts. The poor Africans and Black country of Haiti were forced. Here is the nobility of France, not wanting to pay taxes, uh, having lucrative jobs, that they were being overpaid for so that they could make money and they weren't doing anything. They were eating in excess, gambling, fornicating the whole nine yards, right? When change was afoot and the indecisive king was trying to 
push for change, he went through four ministers of finance. And because he couldn't put his foot down with the nobility, eventually the commoner had his head on the chopping block, literally him and his wife, right? But later on, the French would support, uh, the Americans, my apologies, would support the French in what they did in Haiti to get some $2 billion at the time of reparations against a poor country. Keep, keep that contextually in the back of your mind. There is an argument against why, you know, oh, forget slavery, forget reparations. Let's all love one another now. Those are my ancestors. It had nothing to do with it. But the most egregious example of reparations that have ever been paid, it was the French who took it, took the liberty, and they did it against a former colony, Haiti, and against the poorest of the poorest. And those people didn't finish paying that off until they were dirt poor. And, and listen, to be very clear, Haitians have a long history of internal self-government, their own Haitian people who robbed and pillaged and, and done enough harm, but also make it very, very clear that having to pay back $2 billion in reparations has made that country what it is today. The worst country in the world almost in terms of poverty, now gang violence. They've just entered um, Caribbean Media Group. I saw um, uh, Madam, um, what's her name? She writes in the Miami Herald. Um, Jacqueline Charles sent out her latest article, which says violence erupts in Haiti during protests by police officers because apparently they've just killed like 10 police officers this week. You know, it, it just is, um, it's horrible. And it's, it's, it offends all sensibility, but everything is connected. So somebody says that they don't know um, why people are so averse to learning, well, neither do I, because the very fact that we are um, learning these things, you know, should allow us to hopefully make better decisions. Oh God, Jonathan, you are single. You are, <laughs> Jonathan, you are single-minded in a way that, that you should really explore some options. So he says, you just had to throw gambling into it. No, I didn't throw gambling into it. Um, this entire special talked about his wife loved to gamble at the most expensive parlors and blah, blah. That has nothing to do with me throwing gambling into it. Listen, just because you are pro gambling, you're pro pot smoking, you're pro giggle dancing and gyrating on poles and whatever, right? Those things have been along around a lot longer than you have been and they're part of history. And if someone mentions the word gambling, you shouldn't really get up in arms about it. That's not what this discussion is about this morning. Try to try to stay focused now. Don't be singular minded because that's one of the things in life that will trap you. You need to be able to entertain more than one idea at the same time. So Alejandro says, I love these subjects, history, social studies, et cetera. Let's continue. All right, here we go. Yes, and justice towards society. And they're laughing at this concept. How dare this Protestant bourgeois write such rubbish? Oh, Lord, heaven forbid that we talk about equality amongst all men. Mm -hmm. Louis promised to back Necker all the way, mm -hmm. just as he had with Turgot. Mm -hmm. Poor him, he tried, he just didn't have it in him. Redire, je le Some people verre. don't have what it takes. Si nous laissons faire Necker, la gloire de Louis XIV cédera bientôt le pas à l'anarchie la plus extrême. So, as the, the, Parce que notre um, ministre se gargarise de mots, elite started to fight nous allons lui retourner. Poor Louis again fired his finance minister, and it's like, here we go. Je ne suis décidément pas fait pour la colère, you know, et encore moins pour la violence. Marie-Antoinette encouraged her husband to be strong this time. For her. But once again, he began to dither. Yes. Là, comme recommencer comme au départ de Monsieur Turgot. She had a little more oui. sense than him, Charles. She should have been queen. Si vous cette fois ne pas reculer. So she's praying that he's not going to back down this time. Louis XVI was not a decisive man by nature. He was a decent man. Um, he was controlled more by his ministers than previous kings had been. But then he was facing a different situation. So, despite listen. his wife's advice, Louis decided that Necker had to go. 
Yep. There he goes the again. The second attempt to confront the French nobility had ended just like the first one, in complete failure. <laughs> ah. All right, here we go again. History repeating itself. Now, I want to I want to talk to you all about something here cuz I'm going to fast forward into a little segment here. So he brings a third minister on again. And at first he's like, oh, you know, we have to act as if there's no shortage of money. So his philosophy was, oh, let's just spend as though there's no tomorrow. Boy, I tell you what, that was a very ignorant idea. So um, that didn't work out too well because they actually had no money. The government had no money. Marie Antoinette had given the French people an heir to the throne. But mm -hmm. as an Austrian Sorry. outsider, she had never been very popular. Now, as the financial crisis deepened, ordinary people came to see her not as their queen, but as a symbol of the selfishness of the aristocratic elite. So listen, they're upset with the king, but they take it out on the queen simply because she is a foreigner, really, right? Now, I want y'all to pay attention to how they did it because they were brutal with how they treated her. When we get on platforms here and we talk about our politicians, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute, um, this this actually leads to somewhere very, very logical. You know, some of y'all get up in arms like, oh, my God, let's not hurt Makiva's feelings. Oh, you know, we not we don't want to talk about Chris Saunders or we don't want to have a word about the premiere or whatever. And their performance. Let me tell you something. The people in this day had no no qualms about it. Look at what they did. L listen to how they treated her as the queen of their country. It's a truism of history that when there's economic stress, people look around for who to blame. And mm -hmm. it was all too easy to blame the Austrian, Lutricienne. Now, l let me just repeat what she just said, because she said it in such a beautiful British accent. It's a truism of history that when there are economic difficulties, people look around at who to blame. Does that sound familiar? Are we not doing that right now? We're having economic difficulties? Listen, in the heyday in Cayman of the 80s and early 90s, tourism was, was booming, life was booming. You know, we had a lot of the same problems that we have now. And a lot of you all, the drug smuggling and the money running and the, and the money laundering, you were turning a blind eye to all of those problems because financially, you were in a better position. You could pretty much buy whatever you want. You guys are out there buying expensive cars, living to the hilt. It didn't mean that your issues did not exist, but it is a lot easier to ignore your social issues, yes, when the money is flowing and when the economy is doing well. Hmm, isn't that interesting? And that she had an extravagant court and that the country people were starving and she was having parties and giving balls. So that's really what caused the major downturn in her reputation. Uh -huh. There was a stream of um, salacious pamphlets ah, come here out we go. about Marie Antoinette in the 1770s and 1780s. Salacious pamphlets. Listen. They, we, Ma Road can't hold a candle to what the French were doing back then. Look at what they did to this poor woman. The sorts of things uh, that they'd say, that she has a very wild sex life, frustrated in her relations with the king. She has sexual relations with his brothers. She's the new Messalina. She's the new sort of sexually wild person at court. And this is dragging the monarchy down. For me, I habitué à tout. On m'a prêté des amants, on me prête des... So this is her saying that I've got used to any and everything. They've claimed that I have lovers. Now they claim that I have mistresses. Uh -huh. I would not care if people are not trying to attack you through me. Uh -huh. One of the innuendos was that uh, Marie Antoinette had uh, an affair with uh, Carl de Rouen, who was the, the court almoner. And he then passed venereal disease on to every woman in the court. Uh, that, that, that is the sort of thing that went around. It was very gross. The grosser, the better. They make mm. anything that people may put up with today look absolutely mild. They are so gross. They are really lewd mm. with detail and illustrations. Lewd. One Lord, of the have points mercy. the satirists made in their pamphlets was that Marie Antoinette had it off with her brother-in-law, the Comte d'Artois. You know, you take a story like she's having it off with her brother-in-law, and then how do you prove she's not? 
that was the trouble, so everybody liked to believe it. Mm. I think the king, who was a very nice man, was very upset by it. Louis himself was also a victim of the pamphleteers. Ce sont nos réformes que l'on cherche encore et toujours à abattre. Au reste, voyez ce que l'on fait aujourd'hui de moi. He's like, look at what they're portraying me as now. Small, fat, idiot, stupid, clumsy, sleepy, drunk, dirty-minded. Interested only in hunting and ivory. Il semble qu'il n'y ait personne moins fait que moi pour diriger. He says it would seem that I am the person least capable of leading France. What a mess. J'ai la France. Il suffit d'un ordre, sire, et nous ferons cesser ces publications et punir. So then, of course, you know, one of his advisors steps in and says, hey, we shall stop the publications and punish the guilty party. So, you know, some people always want to, um, to try to take down um, anyone who, and you know, this, this stuff is without a doubt nasty and disgusting, whatever, but is, is the solution to actually um, try to uh, stop the discord by, you know, um, oh gosh. Yeah. Eddie said that, Eddie just said that YouTube stopped it. All right. Switch, switch, switch um, over on Facebook. But the, the question really is whether or not the, the appropriate response to that sort of stuff is this heavy handed kind of like even what our governments do today. Um, you know, we're, we're going to shut down this publication. You can't talk about, you know, anything that we do or, you know, so that was a suggestion of some people, but Louis, of course, yeah, being as no. indecisive was his, no, wife, his wife, said no. She said, I don't want anyone to be pers persecuted in my name. From Just everything leave them read, alone. Louis assumed that the whole country now despised him. But if so anyway, it goes on. It's a, it's a very, very interesting um, story. Some of you are sh asking for the link. I will definitely um, provide it to you uh, so that you can have um, a look. It is, it is beyond interesting. And um, as usual, I think it's just one of those things where, you know, history repeats itself. And we are doomed if we do not understand, um, uh, if we do not understand history. So, um, yeah. All right. So it is what it is. Um, I mean, like I said, I'm into this whole series right now about this particular part of history. And um, it is most fascinating. It really, really is. So, yeah, apparently YouTube has blocked this. Oh, gosh, they're so. <sighs> try, try Facebook. Facebook is good. Bobo. Oh, someone said it just came back up. Ah, there you go. Um, so it, it's a much more Alejandro is asking it. Um, this is like Netflix crown, isn't it? Not really, because this is historians actually telling the story and people who've done the research. The Crown, um, Netflix stories like The Crown and whatever, they have a lot of creative license and so not everything is true. There are some truthful elements to it. And then some of it is embellishment for um, entertainment purposes, right? So, uh, you know, it's, 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 um, it's you, you, gotta, you gotta learn, trust me. I find history to be so particularly interesting. Um, King Charles I of England, who was a relative, I think might have been his uncle or something of Louis, got beheaded uh, during his reign. And of course, he was very, very concerned about the implications of that because you heard what the man said. Um, ideas travel. People get ideas in their head. And back in those days, I tell you what, the way that they de dealt with the... Um, uh, nobility when they had had enough is they would put your head on a chopping block and simply chop it off. And that was the end of your reign. It wasn't, oh, we're going to find charges of whatever. And we could go through a fair trial and you have a defense attorney and you have your day in jail. That's not how they dealt with the matter. You, your wife, sometimes the kids, they're next one, the chopping block too. And they just eliminated the entire family. Gosh, how far have we come, huh? At least we're not doing that bit anymore. But um, I, I find it I find it absolutely fascinating. So let's talk about Cayman politics for a little bit. We do have a, a segment of Cayman voices coming up, so I do want to keep an eye on the time. I'll ask for a little bit of overtime this morning as well. But listen to me. Um, you know, at the end of the day, oh my God, 
I get angry legitimately when I hear certain things that are happening in the Cayman Islands from on the political front. I like to give people an opportunity, right? Sometimes the person that you think will not make the best representative, once they get in there, they surprise you and they perform and they serve the people in a respectable manner. They give you their best. Yeah. I've said to you guys before, I'm of the opinion, and this is just my opinion, and you know, take it or leave it, that a lot of our elected officials are simply not qualified to do what they have taken on as a task. And there are a number of reasons why, by the way, LFT results, negative, we're still good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, you know, a lot of them are just not up for the task because they have not had any sort of um, training. And I don't mean just formal education. That is one type of training that can be helpful. But we've also heard of people being completely educated fools. So academically, someone can be brilliant when it comes to the practicalities, like Louis the Sixteenth of implementation, they miss the mark. And you can miss the mark for so many different reasons. Listen, they said Louis the Sixteenth was a nice guy. Being in politics isn't always about being a nice person. It's about having the um, ability to lead people, both politically within your, your political organization, within the structure of the government, you know, um, maneuver the civil service, which can be extremely tricky, right? Uh, reach the people of the Cayman Islands, the commoner in the street. You've got to work with everybody. So yes, the premier has to bridge the gap between the ultra elite, which are needed in any country, the business class and merchant class, which are needed in any country, the middle and lower class, which are part and parcel of any society. So it's not an easy job. And I don't want people to think that I'm here underestimating what it is that our politicians should be doing. But alas, some of them simply do not have the personality traits that they should to be effective leaders. What am I talking about? Well, I am talking about uh, people who are disrespectful. Yeah. So listen, at the very minimum, I would say that in life, you know, you're in a position, um, the people have elected you, and I think you should never forget who actually put you there. Now, you guys know I say all the time, that doesn't mean that you bend over backwards for the people because sometimes you have to tell the people the truth about a particular situation. Louis the Sixteenth was trying to tell his rich friends and family members the truth about the finances of the country, and they were not willing to listen. Eventually, he paid the ultimate price. His neck paid the ultimate price, right? So sometimes you have to be prepared to go against the grain. But I've recognized that in this country, some people have a propensity to let things go to their heads. There's something to be said for remaining humble. And not everybody has that talent. It's not even a talent. It is a personality trait in my honest opinion. So when people get elected to public office, as, as them old people would say, you know, they forget from whence they came. They think their S doesn't stink like the rest of us. I begin to make some observations. And you know, my little black book, it's actually uh, blue. I start jotting down some notes because I think to myself, oh God, here we go. You get in two terms. All of a sudden you think you're the cat's meow. You get a ministerial position. Nobody can't tell you nothing. You know everything. Hmm? You have no respect for people. You don't know how to talk to people. Your arrogance, which quite interestingly enough, has always been there. Somebody just said, are we talking about so-and-so today? Boy, y'all too smart. Try and hush. You are too smart, girl. Stop guessing who I'm talking about. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Another person says emotional intelligence. 
narcissism, arrogance. Yes, we got we got talking about some of this with our politic our politicians. Yeah. This is something that we have to be concerned about, and I'm going to tell you why. Because it has a real impact, a real implication on the lives of the people in this country. Let me tell you one thing. I sit here and I say to you all, we need this world-class civil service that we keep getting promised. However, politicians need to be respectful to the civil service. Yes, there are some of them who do not do their jobs and they make the entire civil service look bad, yeah? I don't curry favor with those people, okay? I, I will call them out for what they are, lazy, unmotivated, barely scraping by, wasting the people's money. But as I've always made clear, I've even called them donkeys, and I know that that upset France Madison because France really supports his civil service. But France, I'm only talking about the 10 or 15% of your civil service, I hope to God is no more than that, that manages to let us down on a regular basis. And some of them are, are, are chief officers. Some of them are high management people within the civil service. However, there are politicians who are acquiring a reputation, and two of them in particular, a third one, He's not as smart, you see. So he's a little bit slower on the uptick. All men, right? Who go into these positions and they think that once they're there in a minister, they know as ministers, they know it all. They're liars. They're narcissistic. They want to throw the civil service under the table with their lies. And I know of several critical examples. And I'm telling these guys that you will not fool the people of this country because I am here getting this information. Let me pull out my little notebook, writing it down. And if you think the election, which in my opinion is right around the corner, that I now got to be exposing exactly who you are, you got another thing coming. Yes, that person says so-and-so is in that mix too. He's the one that I said not too bright, but trying to control agencies and departments that fall under him. Birds of a feather. But you see, the more intelligent, manipulative, and narcissistic of the group tries to play everybody. They will lie to your face like a Spanish machete and at the same time chopping you off at the knees. So even within the world of the PAC government and within the world of politics, some of them cannot be trusted and they play a lot of psychological games. One in particular plays a lot of psychological games with people. And they think that they're fooling people. Boy, I tell you what. I, I am thankful every single day to the good Lord. Because he gave me the gift of discernment. Not too many people fool me. And if you're fooling me, you rest assured that you do not fool me for long. Yes? But, you know, I'm one of those people that's going to sit back, as Aunt Lotta used to say, give you enough rope because <laughs> you're going to do the job for us. We're going to give you the next two years worth of rope to hang yourself. But I'm watching you, both eyes wide open, and you are not going to fool the people of the Cayman Islands in the next election. Having your PAs in tears and crying. Remember when I told you guys that story about the um, former health, uh, oh gosh, what was her name again? Um, Dr. Oh gosh, help me out now. The health, um, mm, she was our temporary interim, interim uh, health. Oh my gosh, what was her, what was her name again? You guys know who I'm talking about. The one who at first, CMO. Thank you, Mark. Yes, Chief Medical Officer, right? Remember when I, when we did that story about how she was attacked? And they're like, no, I don't know where Sandy get that from. Um, that wasn't true. Yaddy, 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 blah, blah, blah. Listen to me. Not only was it true, it was really disrespectful and egregious how they went at that poor woman. Yeah? They tried to downplay 
the situation, everything we said was 100% spot on. Now, you would think that if somebody calls you out for bad behavior, you'd be like, damn, I better be on my best behavior. But the level of arrogance and narcissism that we're dealing with, with these so-called ministers and politicians, takes it to another level. They don't learn easily. So they expect the civil service, right? To roll out a red carpet to them when it comes to their personal lives. When they travel with wives and families and whatever, they are not necessarily entitled to the same treatment as when they're traveling in official capacity. But you think that they know anything about protocol? I wasn't going to go there today, but I want to tell you something. This government has the chief protocol officer right now in a situation that they better hurry up and finish investigating and resolve. And it stems around a particular minister who wasn't getting his way. Hmm? Listen to me carefully now. Taking family in secured areas of the airport, that if the federal agencies, the FAA and all these agencies knew that this was happening, we would have some serious implications because we're not following security protocols. So they were on a witch hunt and unfortunately they found something or they think they found something where they can cut her off at the knees now and get her out of the way. Because, oh, she's not approving over time. She isn't going to prove over time for people under her, right? To work outside of the terms of their civil service contracts to make sure particular ministers and their families are taken care of at the airport. That's not what they're supposed to do. It's this type of behavior, folks, that is problematic and extremely egregious. You hear me talking about the French this morning? All of us should be adhering to the same equal rules. What applies for me applies for you. Yes, they get certain privileges as a minister of government, but that privilege doesn't extend to your family, honey child. Huh? Your family doesn't get diplomatic status. They don't get to sneak into the airport and, and drive in a government vehicle all the way up to the tarmac like you would. But you see, this is the foolishness that has happened in this country behind the scenes. And I am sitting down making notations in my notebook and I'm getting sick and tired of it. When I hear of, of, of ministers traveling and because um, civil servants didn't roll out the red carpet when they're going on vacation in the Caribbean and this and that and blah, blah, blah that they have the audacity to pick up the phone or to email or to say disgusting things to these poor PAs. You're, oh, you're horrible. You're incompetent. You're this, you're that. Yelling and screaming to the point where the civil servants, the PAs are in literal tears. Yeah? I say, hold on one second, Henno. You know, it wouldn't be me crying. I would have boxed you down with your rudeness. Have some decency about yourself, right? You know what they say about a monkey? The higher you crawl, the more you expose your your nasty behind and the harder you are going to fall. Y'all need to shape up, right? Now they get a little position. The sexual harassment. Oh, well, you know, I'm minister of such and such. So therefore, you should be sleeping with me. I want to be touching you in the workplace and all this kind of stuff. Saying inappropriate stuff to to civil servants. Y'all don't think people talk? Let me tell you something. It's been happening from the beginning and people have tried to warn the one, two ministers that keep doing it, saying, listen, you've gotten here, despite everybody saying, boy, I don't even know if you really came in. You listening to me? 
you've gotten here. Show the people what a great minister you can be. Show the people that those degrees and all this experience you clean you got is not going to be a complete farce and a complete waste. Be about their business. Focus on the business of the people. We just got rid of the progressive government. We didn't want them. We're sick and tired of them and their shenanigans. They're selling the country down the proverbial river, right? Power at any cost. Only God knows how many back pockets they're in. We voted in something different because we wanted something different. But already you are starting to show your true colors. No person. Yesterday we talked about sexual harassment in the RCIPS. No civil servant or anybody in this country should be subjected to this, and especially not from ministers of government. So all of a sudden, you're a minister of government, and you think your little noodle is special. It ain't special, honey child. Nobody don't care about that. Maintain your professional professionalism. Do not approach civil servants with any sexual innuendos, requesting sexual favors and all this kind of stuff. Be respectful. Treat people with respect and dignity. There's a way that even when you're saying, you know, your performance is less than stellar, there's a way in which you do it where you don't have people crying and in tears and distraught because you don't even know how to talk to people. Yelling and screaming at people like you some kind of friggin' animal. If we wanted that, we would have put the progressives back in office, to be honest. Step up to the plate and do better. We expected better. I'm telling you, some of y'all in trouble come the next election. You would think that because your wife don't know that you cheating on her, that the rest of the Cayman Islands don't know? The wife that stood by you during financial hard times? Right? Don't mess with that, you know? Because people talk. And when I tell you that people love to talk to me in particular, whew, boy, you better believe it. Pictures of you with that young lady who happens to be a drug addict that is your sexual preference? You don't think that I know about it? You don't think that the pictures and videos were shared? You don't think that I get copies of stuff? Well, <laughs> y'all keep it up. Keep it up. I'm on a fact-finding mission these days to collect as much information as possible. And sometimes what I will do is I will collect it and just sit on it because your time coming. They say time longer than rope. All right. We giving you the rope, you know, because you're going to hang yourself. There's something wrong with these politicians. And I must tell you, not to make this a sexist argument, but by and large, Women tend to be better at this sort of thing. At least you're not going to have the sexual harassment and those components of it. Yeah. Women can be narcissists too. Don't get me wrong. So when y'all heard me call out Kathy for being dishonest over wanting that Speaker of the House position, that's a fact. Now, you know how I feel about honesty. If I can't trust you, honey child, me and you can't, we can't break bread. But that's not going to work. However, you think that I'm going to be afraid to call out Chris Saunders, J.E. Banks, Kenneth Bryan, McKeeva Bush? Not today, Bobo. Get your act together. People talk, ministers. They talk about how you show up at a board meeting and demand that somebody at a particular agency gets a pay raise 
And next thing you know, a pay raise is voted by the board for that person. And everybody else in the organization can't get a pay raise on now. And nobody's saying that the young IT man didn't deserve a pay raise. But you as minister who wants to jump on the radio every minute talking about you can't interfere in the civil service because, you know, you'll get in trouble just like this other one got in trouble and blah, blah, blah. You should be aware that people are aware of the fact that you went to a board meeting and said, give this young man a pay raise. And his mom, it happens to be one of your political supporters. I tell y'all, my mount not joined church, but it has joined the truth. Yeah? Y'all need to do better. And then y'all want to put up this front about, oh, me and my wife, we're so happily married. And I put my family first. And I want to go to church and praise the Lord. What a mockery. McKeever Bush, poor him. He told me he's stressed out. His little ticker has got heart palpitations now because the noose is tightening the investigations. A file going to the DPP's office, both files. So he's stressed out. He run in Health City. Oh, check my heart. Health City's like, nope, you're good. Get out of here. <laughs> No angina, no blockages, nothing wrong with you. You'll be a okay. He got his PA sent up messages. Oh, you, please don't stress me out. When you be grappling and grabbing women stuff, you don't think you're stressing them out, Ottawa? When you have victimized people with sexual harassment, you don't think that that stresses them out? Assaulting them stresses them out. Have you? Did you think about them? I hear the joke about McKeever. He don't know that I know that he was at Bananas this weekend celebrating his birthday. Maybe that's what made your heart speed up. Because as usual, allegations and photos. You don't think people take pictures of you when you go out? At this point, you'd be stupid to think that they don't. Being drunk and sloppy as usual. Oh, I had a quiet birthday at home. <laughs> I don't know who the hell you believe you fooling, son. But it ain't, it is not me. And by extension, it is not the people of the Cayman Islands. Wee wee. You hear my sinuses getting kind of irritated. That's that's why I wanted to do an LFT test today. I do feel a little bit irritated, but look like it just sinuses. Wee wee says, I love class today, honey child. You know, Friday session always be a little bit hotter than usual. Uh, Sabina says, Kevin bananas say it not so. Mm, child, please. He was, yes, he was up in bananas. Having a jolly good time, being sloppy and drunk as usual, and people are taking photos, and other people have seen the photos and shared the photos. Make him sit there. Some people are not capable of learning, you know. They, they, she's so pissed. I don't know. Heads tough, like I don't know what. Salvin, good morning. He says, Ken Turk fried chicken. Hello, Nicholas. Why are we collecting truths rather than exposing them? Oh, no, 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 no. Nicholas, let me be very, very clear. The truth always gets exposed. Yeah? But if I come in here and I tell you about a singular incident with a minister, you are going to, oh, I can give him the benefit of the doubt, you know? I don't know. Maybe she was looking at him kind of funny and this and that. You collect as much evidence as possible to build a case that will be indisputable. That's why it's being collected. Oh, I got a fresh, fresh box of tissues here this morning because the sinus is not going to stop me from telling the truth today here either. Rosemary, Rosanna, sorry. Says so the church of the truth will set you free. Amen. Johan is in the house. Johan says, Dear Father God, please make the internet go down forever. <laughs> and all of the CMR electronics never work again. Or she becomes a mute. Uh, should Sandra ever get sex pictures of me? Lord have mercy. I think I'd go blind if I got sex pictures of you, Johan. Lord Jesus. I want to see that. He's so stupid. <laughs> Your head is ridiculous. Woo. But you know, 
When you decide to get into the world of politics, you would believe or you would think that they have enough common sense to behave, but they're such narcissists and they, and they think that they're above the law. They think they're above moral law. They think they're above the law law and just the law of the people having good common sense. Miss Sue says, well done, Sandy. It's about time that this comes out disgraceful. Poor Amelia, she, she in shock? You in shock over the truth, girl? Cameron says, Sandy must have had pepper jelly in her croissant this morning. No, my love, let me tell you something. Sometimes my mind, do, my head do kind of take me a little bit, you know. I got to tell you the truth. I hear stuff and I hear stuff and I sit back, like I said, I make my observations. I don't like to jump. And when you see me jumping, rest assured, it's a big, uh, uh, listen, I've been standing on the platform a long time before I jump. Let me take a break and sort out my sinuses one moment, please. Whopping news! Burger King K-Man is turning 40 years old and celebrating by giving away over $40,000 of prizes. Just spend $4 to receive a scratch card for your chance to win thousands of food prizes, Burger King merch, and the king of prizes. 10 cash prizes of $1,982. From December 23rd till February 1st, visit your favorite BK location to win big with Burger King's 40th anniversary. Terms and conditions apply. Crichton Properties is one of Cayman's most trusted real estate companies for over 50 years. We offer a diverse selection of property listings and help our clients navigate the world of buying or selling their properties with confidence. Crichton is a name you can trust with our excellent customer service and family-friendly touch. Contact us today to list your home, land, or condo for sale by calling 949-5250 or email info at crichtonproperties.com. Crichton Properties, a trusted Cereba member. Listen very carefully, folks. At the end of the day, yeah, I can like people as an individual, although some of these people I don't really like if I had to be honest about it. And I can see your potential. But when you begin to not live up to your potential, right? and you begin to allow these really bad sides of your character to come out and to become visible, I have an obligation first and foremost to the truth, to the people of this country and the people of the Cayman Islands. So there will be some people, what is say, you can fool some of the people some of the time. There will be some people who will continue to be fooled by you and your shenanigans. And the little people that you go to church with them and be like, oh, you're so sweet. You come in with the whole family next week. Oh, God, that's so nice of you. And I'm sitting here going, let me tell you what the real truth is. And then them see more people tune into the core hard truth. And they're like, oh, my God, I had no idea that that went a little devil, you know? Uh, Dean Gillette says, to their credit, these politicians and ministers are good at one thing, and that is victimization and blackballing people for no reasons. Huh. No, sir. Sabrina says, oh, snap. Johan says, a quote by Thoreau, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. Hmm. Well, y'all need to see the truth this morning. And I'm really imploring, listen, you're only halfway through your term, right? You can turn it around and stop this bad behavior. Keep the narcissism at bay. Get some professional help. Go to therapy. Stop being manipulative. Stop being a liar. Stop being a Spanish machete. Lord, that might be a lot to be asking these people. Power hungry. Every other week, I get a phone call, Sandy. Boy, I hear Miss Stacy. I need some more tea this morning, child. The tea done finishing in here. Um, Sandy, <coughs> I hear they going after poor Ween. You know, they want that position. <laughs> and 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 they're making Ween life miserable. When I ask him, I said, "Um, I keep hearing these rumors on the street about you want premiership." No, no, no. Oh, Sunday, Sunday. No, Sunday. You know, no, no. 
No, man. Ween is the best. He's the best leader because he has a temperament for it. Well, I know that. Uh, you're saying that out of your liar mouth, your double machete Spanish mouth. Spanish machete, I mean, uh, duplicity. I know that. Some people in the Cayman Islands might know that. But I also know that you guys are self-serving. And if you could get that position from him, you'd be all too happy to have it. You, you Have y'all been paying attention to what's been happening in the Legislative Assembly when they had the debate about the buildings? All of a sudden, Alden and Kenneth, who have been at each other's throats, and McKeever Bush can all be bosom friends, and across the aisle from each other, they're sitting there talking about, um, oh, um, here, Alden, now, because you know him, anything for power and position, because he got to get back in there. He won't be premier again. So here he comes now. Yes, well, I, I must support. I must support McKeeva Bush in his position about hundred-story buildings, and I, I must support the good minister of tourism. Since when he become a good minister of tourism? You can't even stand him except when it's convenient for your political games. You know, you thought that he was nobody and incapable, but when it is useful for you. All of a sudden, he's a good minister of tourism. And yes, we all agree on this position. Now, I'm not having the discussion about buildings because I do believe that we have to go up. How high is the question? There has to be a limit and it has to be restricted to particular zones. But the point that I am telling you all here today is that these politicians have no loyalty to the people of the Cayman Islands, a lot of them, most of them. The only thing they're loyal to is themselves, their paycheck, and some of them are loyal to their own family. Some of them not even loyal to that. Because if you are there cheating on your wife and then trying to pretend that she the best thing that happened to you in, in 30 years, you know you you a liar. Mm -hmm. And some of them get so upset. Here, here, here you know. Let me tell y'all a story. And I'm somebody to say every woman need a good buddy. When you have a side piece, you can't be getting upset over the side piece with somebody else who has their side piece. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Y'all like, what the hell, Sandy? Tell me. Let me try and break it down for you, right? You know, some of these women, well, they got more than one, one man that they be dealing with that not, they're not in a committed relationship. So I know one minister, he checking this girl, um, work police and all kind of stuff. That's all I'm going to say. He checking her. And he getting upset with other married men that she be checking or has checked in the past. Don't want to talk to them on the streets. <laughs> I'm like, you know, y'all really foolish. If we're going to be real and we're all out here fornicating and having adulterous relationships and whatever. You think she loyal to you? Oh, okay. Like I said, that little noodle might not be performing like what you think. She got other friends too. She got other buddies too. Don't be getting up in arms about it. How can you get upset about something that, that not even yours? It's yours in the moment. You get it for a little 15 minutes and that's it. Adjust your attitude. No, sir. I tell you what, listen, I know some of them listening to the talk show right here now. And they're thinking to themselves, well, Sandy trying to slander people. I can call in. Don't, don't make the mistake of calling in here today. Bring, bring it, bring the tea through Miss Stacy. Bring that hot tea, honey child. Woo. Things hot up in here today. Thank you, my dear. I think I need a little Vicks to, to, there's one little small one right there. So let me have that to try and clear up the sinuses. Lord Jesus, do not make them call the show today and challenge me about my truth because I might have to play the video. I might have to show the pictures of the little noodle and then they're going to be embarrassed on national, um, on national, uh, what are we on? Radio. Don't do it. I know, I know you're tempted. I'm putting on my Vixen right now. I am telling you, do not call the show. Who the cat fit? Make them wear it. 
if it don't apply to you, then don't have nothing to say to me about it. But y'all know. The three of you that I'm referring to ministers, you know exactly who I'm talking about. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Poor Premier Panton. He what mess. Premier, you better have come back on the show. So um, somebody was telling me recently that the premier went to Miami the other day. He took a little trip, some meeting or something he had to go to. And, um, you know, he's so conscious of the optics of, of some of these things that he decided, uh, look at me, Vic's all over the place. But I got to clear up my sinuses. He decided that he was not going to um, <clears throat> take his assistant because she's a female and he didn't like how the optics of that looked. You know, that he would rather take his driver to escort him and whatever. Some of these other dudes, they be out here in the streets doing the most. They don't care about optics. They don't care about the truth. Nothing. It's so shameful. Because the problem is, right? People's personal lives are their personal lives, except when it becomes in the public domain. The issue that I have with it is your behavior is impacting the civil service. Now, the civil service is the largest employer on these islands, and they're, they're also the largest voting bloc on this island. If you think that you're going to go in there, minister, and manage to piss off the civil servant with your behavior, civil service, and not have some repercussions in the next election, you better think again. Civil servants, call me. Y'all have my private number, 324-1612. It's not real all that private. Everybody got it. Call me on that number. You got the next number. You can find me at the signal. You can WhatsApp me. If you want a U.S. number, I can give you that too. We can go incognito with the conversation. Y'all need to speak up. The same way I defended any vic victim yesterday of sexual harassment, that includes you, honey child. You do not have to put up with this foolishness. I will do my best to protect you and protect your identity because rest assured, unfortunately, you're not the only victim. And ministers cannot continue with this type of behavior without being held to account. And if you continue with the behavior, it's not going to be just the next general election that you're held to account. We got to start going to the RCIPS and saying, well, you got one, you got McKeever Bush, deal with him. Now let's deal with some other ministers as well. Leave people alone. They're not interested in you and the noodle toodle. Try to be a professional. Johan says, tell them about those MPs with miniature tools. That foolishness enough to send, well, that is foolish enough to send sex videos and sending pics all over the place. Child, they not got no sense. When I tell you something wrong with these people, a couple of months ago, I caught one red-handed, right? He's so stupid. Like I tell you, some of them not even smart enough to pull off cheating. So he got caught red-handed and I messaged him and I said, minister, um, you messaging somebody right now? You in Jamaica and you messaging somebody right now. Oh, 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 oh Sandy, what, 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 what do you mean? I'm not messaging nobody. I have the screenshots, minister. I have the time stamps. I have you sending selfies of you and government officials in Jamaica trying to play big. You see how stupid they are? No, no, no. My account was hacked. Okay. Let me try to understand this one. Oh, yeah. Um, Anthony said he want to hear a kaboom. Here we go. Kaboom! Listen to how stupid this one is. Somebody hacked your account, but they have a real-time photo of you in Jamaica with dignitaries in Jamaica? I look stupid, right? I'm, I must look stupid to you because that's the only reason why you tell me some bullshit like that. I said, sir, get your life together. 
Oh no, me and my wife, I love my wife and my family very much. Sure you do. Uh-huh. Of course you love her very much. <laughs> so much so that you over there telling this woman about, oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a government minister. I'm, a, I'm an important person in the Cayman Islands. <laughs> Where can we meet up? Yes. Floating around that position of being minister because apparently... That gets you the girls, honey child. I'm telling y'all, you need to stop it. No stuff. Strong will get sued. Get sued for what? The truth? <laughs> Beh behave yourself now because you know I speak in the truth. And absolute defense to defamation is the truth. Yeah. Now why not? I'm not winning that lawsuit all now. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, Alejandra says, my girl and I was talking about harassing for sex yesterday, Sandy, because the subject, um, she was like to me, where's the video evidence as proof? Chill. Mm -mm. Anthony says, I'm salty. Cracker is a little bit salty, extra salty today for sure. My God. Dean says alcohol, cocaine, and corruption. Well, I don't know nothing about the cocaine part. You know, I'm not blaming it on the alcohol. How that song go? Blame it on the alcohol. I'm not blaming it on that either. Corruption, lack of morality, narcissism, disgusting behavior. Uh, you think you're somebody special. I don't know what we can call it, child, but it is what it is. Mm -mm. Yes, sir. Y'all need to do better with their nastiness. <sighs> um, Salvin says, from my observation, you made indirectly call it on two ministers and then mentioned another, which is a total of three. This seems to be a move by the cold hard truth to force the ministers in question um, in, a in a certain direction not to break up the government. Yes, listen to me. I have no interest in breaking up the government because unfortunately this is the best we can get. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's kind of sad, but you know, you got to take what you can get. What I'm trying to force people to do is simply get their act together. You know, it's as simple as that. If you were about the people's business as much as you were about trying to pretend like you somewhat special, we could actually, that same energy, if we had that, about solving some of the economic problems, communicating with the people, all that kind of stuff. Yo, we would be getting somewhere. But you're allowing all this other foolishness to be a distraction. Because, you know, these men are not capable. It's like they're, they're single-minded. They're not capable of saying, all right, I got to have a little side buddy, but I'm not taking that too serious, and that's not going to be my whole life goal is to, to, to try to impregnate half the Cayman Islands, right? Let me just have a little side piece and keep it on the down low and keep it cool. They are, they're trying to make everybody a side piece and it's a national embarrassment. And then they travel abroad and they be doing the same thing and they think that because they're in Jamaica, they don't understand how small this world is. They think that, that because they're in Jamaica, people don't know. It's like, come on now. No, sir. People are very aware. Real Deal says not everything you hear is accurate. <laughs> I notice that so many want to see the government fail, so they're willing, they're working full-time spreading disinformation. Um, Real Deal, that's another reason why I sit back and I wait. As things happen, I don't come running to you with the stories. There is a method of checking the truthfulness of these things. And I, more than anybody else, is very much aware, especially from the progressives' camp, of the stories and so forth that they're out there peddling. They not know better. Make, make your, hello. They had two ministers who were prolific at cheating on their wives and spouses. And unfortunately for one of them, I got a photo to prove that too, except I don't know what his noodle looks like. So I might have to show it to the wife 
to confirm, is this your bathroom tile floor? And is that his noodle? Dealing with these Spanish women out in these streets. Embarrassment. Maybe getting them pregnant and then send them back home. That's what all y'all better try and sign up for 23 and me. Because when you see you got a cousin or a half sibling in Colombia or Honduras, that way you know where it come from. You soon figure it out. Cameron says 2025 can't come soon enough. I go and buy some shares in corn from now. <laughs> in corn. No, sir. Wee Wee says you're killing me, honey child. They be, they be killing me with their foolishness. Cameron says, don't discourage them, Sandy. Let them call in, huh? Oh, God, they wouldn't be so stupid here today. Oh, Sandy, you're making innuendos and stories, and you don't have any proof. That one, I'm going to be like, bam, you want proof again? You want to see that video? Be careful what you ask for. Be careful. Mm -mm. Al Ray says, please don't call me. <laughs> CMR saying, please don't call me. CMR listener saying, yes, please, Father God, make him call. <laughs> Ooh, they're not that stupid. They're really not that stupid. All right. Ay, ay, ay. I got I gotta pray for y'all. But like I said, shots have been fired. Don't And don't call me after the show either. I don't want to hear from you, actually. I'm just asking you to please get your act together. Right? We might have a little bit of a laugh this morning, but I'm telling you, I do not find your behavior funny. Your reputation in the streets and the civil service all over the island is growing by the minute. And it's not a good look for the country. And it makes me understand that you are simply not about the people's business. And for me, that is the most egregious part of the situation. Mm -hmm. So please get, get, get yourself sorted. I'm not really convinced that these guys are gonna be able to help themselves because at the end of the day, you are who you are. Can a leopard change its stripes? Can a narcissist not be a narcissist? No. They can pretend for a minute. They can pretend long enough to get your vote and then they disappear. Or they can pretend long enough to, to bring you your little turkey for Christmas, your little fruit cake or whatever else they're peddling in. Somebody said the power has gone to their heads. Yes. Because the head was always thinking, oh, I'm better than people. I'm this, that, and the next thing. Mm -hmm. Cameron says, after shows like this, I'm pleased to know I'm not the only one without any behavior. Well, Cameron, you also not a lead in this country. Lots of people in the community don't have no behavior. And for the most part, I have business with them. That's their business. Go out there with your salaciousness, that's on you. But when you want to take up certain positions, right? And you want to be in a leadership position, you want to talk about family values, and you're putting yourself on a pedestal as someone who actually values your wife and this and that, be careful. Because you're out in the streets doing enough to write a book. Mr. Goodlook is still looking for the Minister of Tourism to come onto the program, my dear. Um, I will certainly send the message. You know, there's a lot of issues that they need to be concerned about. And instead of out there making themselves look stupid, insulting the civil service, being rude and the like, the same civil service, the irony of it is it's the same civil service that they have to work with to try and achieve their own goals. And sometimes we wouldn't know why the civil service still wants to work with them. Some of the civil service still in the progressive camp, so we can understand that's why they don't want to work with them. Yeah. Others don't want to work with them because of how they treat people. They don't got no respect. And something do them, you know, because they know I'm sitting here listening and watching. And what do they do? 
continue with this behavior? Like, I'm not going to call him out. Oh, Sandy is my friend. You better know what the definition of a friend is, honey child. Because you're not on my friend list. I might be okay with you. You're an acquaintance. We're not going to beef. But you're not on my friend list. And friend, foe, or whatever, I'm going to still call you behind out. Because you see, my friends would know better. Yeah. My friends would know, oh, shoot, if I do this and Sandy find out, oh, God, here we go. <sighs> Get your life together, please. You had, <laughs> so that's what I really got into Sandra today. Who pissed her off? This is unprecedented and destroys the myth that she's in the pack pay role. Oh, God. They could not pay me enough to not tell the truth. Understand that. There is no money in the world that is worth seeing this country, our little Cayman Islands, right? Not getting the best possible representation. I told y'all before, we offer services on this platform. They can pay for airtime during election summit. I'm not even going to be able to do that because I can tell them no thanks. You have not talked to the people in four years. Why are you coming around here now? Fuck. Just like that, I can tell them. Some of them will not get the privilege of being on this platform and having your ear to listen. Because they're disingenuous. If they really cared about the people, they'd be talking to you on a regular basis. They don't care to talk to you on a regular basis. And then when they get upset with me to tell the truth, they get up on their feelings. They want to run over to Radio K-Man like y'all listening over there. So when election time come, they're going to come with the big paychecks and big, big donations. Oh, Sandy, how much are your packages? I got to say, honey, child, the roster for advertising has been filled. Praise the Lord. Holla. Where can I get? Praise the Lord. Isn't that something? Praise the Lord. When you are not controlled by money and you can say, no, honey, child, the roster done filled up. We will only be accepting so many prospectus candidates this time and you are not on the list because you have not proven yourself to be about the people's business. No, sir. I tell you what. Ms. Sue said they can't, they can change. No way that they can change. Well, I, I am not convinced either because what is that quote about um, corruption? And 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 um and absolute power corrupting absolutely. Yeah. That is a problem. You give these people an opportunity to prove power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. The quote goes on to say, "Great men are always always bad men." even when they exercise influence and not authority, still more when they super add the tendency of the certainty of corruption by authority. It's like there is something inherently wrong with their personality. And it only becomes more apparent as they get more and more power. Because they feel like we don't have no choice. We can't do that. And they feel like they have y'all hoodwinked and they have y'all fooled. Somebody else said they're sucking cup of tea too. I got mine right here, child. But they're not going to be fooled. And by extension, I'm not going to allow them to fool you either. Right? It's not fair to the people. And you are here to joke about some of them. They got in last time, right? By a lot slide. <laughs> With all of the election antics and whatever. So they think now, oh yeah, people love me. Well, let me tell you something. Greater men have fallen. Yeah. And maybe the reason why you got in last time by a landslide is because you didn't have nobody of value running against you. Do not make that mistake and think that that is going to happen again. People are already galvanizing politically. 
groups are being formed and they're saying, okay, strategically speaking, we need to take out this minister, that minister, and this minister. Anyone who is interested in running this country or even being elected to the House of Parliament, start from now to work for the people and prove yourself. We will not be having any Johnny come late Liz jumping up a month before election. And talk about they want to get $9,000 a month to do what? Miss Darlene says, Sandy, it's the same practice with some of the males in the civil service. <laughs> Cameron says, everybody's sinuses are acting up this morning. I can smell that big sab through the airwaves. <laughs> Woo! Ain't going to clear my right up, though. Don't worry about that, Cameron. You know. Um, Selvin says, seemingly you are the whip of the government, but more specifically, the whip for the premier. The whip for the premier? No, sir. No, Bobo. I don't think so. <sighs> Listen. Whips are the party's enforcers? <laughs> Let me be very, very clear about who I'm a whip for. I'm a whip for myself as a voter in this country, as a constituent who went to the polls during the last election and voted and put some of these same fools in. I won't be making that mistake again. I'm a whip for you, the people of the Cayman Islands. Y'all need somebody to tell you the truth. Because like I said, some of you are oblivious to what is actually happening. And you cannot be oblivious when it comes to the, 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 the fact that, you know, we are tethering. We're treading water. It doesn't take much. And the energy that they waste on all of this other stuff, unfortunately, means that they're not putting that energy into solving the people's problems, coming up with strategic policies, implementing those, all that work that has to be done. That is my biggest problem. Darlene, tell Johan to, to find some work to do around the house. Whew, Alejandro having some Asian coffee this morning and his second one. And I love me my daily bread, CMR. Cheers to you. I got to try out this coffee you be drinking. It sounds interesting. Rich Amelia says, yes, sir. Captain Mark says, happy hour so early in the morning. Chill. Yes, thank you, uh, Miss Venice. Says, don't forget our children. We vote for the voiceless, right? Oh, my God. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, what a hot mess. All right, let me see what comments are coming in and what's up. This one says that there's a marine vessel in distress. Uh, 12 miles off of Cayman with three on board, the relevant Marine authorities alerted and dispatched to render aid. The Port Authority is now towing the boat in. Well, praise the Lord that the Port Authority doing something. Good for them. Um, this one says, uh, why are we so a why are we so adverse to learning new things? Sandy. The dead don't know they're dead and stupid, don't know that they're stupid like Makiva. Oh, shit. <laughs> Woo. Sandy, look at the background of the same men that you're talking about. None of them are fit to hold office. Mm. Yes, sir. Mm -mm. This one said, good morning, Friday mornings on fire. Jesus, I have to do these people work. This person at work and she's like, I, I, you're distracting me. From what the streets are saying, so-and-so was misbehaving like that before he was minister. He's just gotten worse. Like I said, it is part of the character, the fiber of who they are. And one has to ask the question, right? Can a tiger change its stripes? Especially when it has no intentions of doing so and there's no motivation to do so. The person goes on, stupid wife turns a blind eye and this other one been out there too. They believe that people don't know their business, you know? That's what they believe. 
But they come sit there. They fool if they think that that's the case. Hmm. Child, I'm trying to figure out whether you're talking about minister so-and-so or both. For the record, I'm talking about both, madam, plus another one. They opening themselves to blackmail two dumbasses. <laughs> oh, mm. This one says, morning. It is so disappointing to hear these stories about some of our government ministers, as I was hoping that they'd be different, but had my doubts. Hope that next election that some of the good ones can get together and form a good party. You got me in stitches with the noodle talk, the power gone to their heads. Yes, sir. This one talking about who is he? It's more than one honey child. Just think about it. Y'all can figure it out. Mm -mm. This next person says that they're doing all this cheating, et cetera. Oh God, my poor computer. Don't, don't even want to read that message. Hold on. Let me pull it up on the phone, honey child. Uh -huh. All right. Morning, listening on the radio. Um, and they're doing all this cheating, et cetera, but call this a Christian island job. They need to try and hush. I said when they be up against the LGBT community, I tell them take take several seats because we know the truth. And some of the same ones who be up against that community want to be a member of that community. They just don't want to be a card carry member. Apparently, they be doing it on the down low, paying underage boys to come and and, and play with the noodle. Yeah, we know about we we know about you two up in church. Talking about you deacon and and all kind of foolishness. <laughs> Y'all need to try and hush. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, my dear. Hello. This one says that one up in a mix too. How she not know? Wifey must know. Girl, we have to talk. Yeah, we can talk. You don't worry about that. You you bring the wine and and I'll bring the water this weekend. Um. This one says, says, Christ, mercy. I'm wearing a pink and white thong today. No need to fact check me on that. No, sir. We don't need to. T TMI. We do not need to know what you're wearing. Um, mm -mm, no, sir. That one is hot. Uh-huh. All right. Well, um, don't cuss the man for going to bananas and mango tree. Maybe his doctor told him to get some fruit and vegetables in his diet. <laughs> Woo, girl, you are hot today. Keep it up. Child. All right. Listen here now. Let me tell you all something. <sighs> Let's talk about John Felder for a minute, that damn crook. And then we're going to play our Cayman Voices segment. So I started to do a little bit of research. I always had my doubts about him because he's, listen, a crook is a crook is a crook and a tiger not changing its stripes. Yeah. So when he was, when his lawyers came to my lawyers, oh, can we settle this? And then I said to my lawyer, I said, what guarantee do we have that he's actually going to pay the $50,000 legal fee? You know, I got no guarantees, but his lawyer's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's keen to settle it, blah, blah, blah. That little SOB. His house was going into foreclosure days before he jumped up and talking about he wants to settle this. Listen to what I'm telling y'all now. Your house going in foreclosure, right? Most people by hook or crook will do anything they can to keep a roof over their head. They might lose the car. They're not paying CUC. So every other month they're going to pay CUC, keep the lights on, right? But they will, at the very minimum, try to keep that mortgage payment going so they can have a little house. This fool gone and lost his house of foreclosure in the United States of America. Days before he settles my agreement, claiming he can pay me $50,000, not pay me, pay my lawyers $50,000 in legal fees. Now, you know, this man is a liar and he's duplicitous. And I have to question how much of this his attorneys knew at Priestley's here in the Cayman Islands because I'm not trusting them either. Scammers. Tell me he getting contract with the Cuban government. Them poor Cubans 
Uh, make him go over there. He they, they'll fix him. He think that Cuba came in. You go treat them like how you treated some Caymanians with your. Oh, I'll give you a warranty. No warranty. Jacked up EVs, vehicles, and motorbikes that don't even work properly. They they gonna fix you. You think because you're seventy eight years old that they care? Foolishness. <laughs> Captain Mark says, Sandy, I can see why you have to keep changing your computer, keep crashing every few weeks. Um, if it have to filter all these comments, Lord. No, sir. So anyway, I'm going to leave that fool to the good Lord. I know I will not be getting my money back, but I won my case. He did not win. Every person now can, even the poor Cubans, can Google his name and see the truth about him. Stay away from this man in business. He means you no good. He will take advantage of you. He's one of them crooks that don't need to be running around. Tell me he's setting up business. His latest business venture, he claims to be selling PPE equipment. COVID. Meanwhile, I'm doing all these online searches on his businesses. One of them has been struck off and not making its annual filings. Did y'all see my story? Go read the story. Proper crooked. I tell you. Uh, unbelievable. Anyway, um, I'm going to leave him to time because I figure that's the only thing that will sort him out. Morning, caller. Happy Friday. Hello? Yeah, Miss Sandy. Yes, morning. sir. Good morning. Um, yesterday, you know, I'm talking about them Cubans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I was working on a boat yesterday on, in um, West Bay. And my goodness, West Bay is the best community. I don't care where anybody got to see in the Islands. I hear you. you know. Big up, big up West Bay. Uh, yeah, but I was in this location and painting this boat. Well, I'm not painting it yet, right? So I'm working in the yard and I walked around because I see some vehicles there that look pretty cool. Uh -huh. And you know, the the owner of the boat came and he was, you know, checking out the boat. And then all of a sudden, I hear this big old motorcycle coming down the road and I'm just coming down. And he comes inside the yard and I was like, oh yeah, this is the, the guy that owns the land. Uh -huh. And he's saying that he heard that there was a Cuban in the yard walking around uh -huh. <laughs> and checking out stuff inside the yard and uh -huh. this and that. Who, he told, who told him that? I don't know. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Because they have kind of in the yard, but in that point in that direction that I went. Uh -huh. So... I'm not a human that they mistaken them for, but I mean, I know I look like a Spaniard, but everybody knows me. <laughs> so I just took the last So yeah, the grid lot, that's why the Cubans do not like to be around there. Oh, okay. What a hot mess. Yeah, and if they are around there, they know them. You know who they are. Right, right, right. Yeah, they, they, you normally see them because they travel in groups. So it's normally exactly. quite easy to identify them. By the way, um, I found this out recently. A lot of people don't know this, but you know, some, occasionally we have some of the women that come over from Cuba and some of them that have come recently, two of those women are actually pregnant. So, oh my. yeah, I want to know how this can work out now with these babies. Cause of course a pregnant woman can be, um, very, very delicate, even in terms of certain diseases and stuff like that. So, you know, they can't have her around the men cause she might get, um, chicken pox and that's dangerous to babies. And, you know, it's a real public health concern. Yeah, they're financially stable by some more than I got it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, my dear, thanks very much. So, um, what a hot mess, child. Yeah, poor, poor people. I feel sorry for them, but they can't come here with no stinking attitude and go around threatening people and begging and breaking into places and doing the most. You know, come here and respect us and we will treat you uh, if you came unkind. That's how Caymanians are. But make sure you adjust your attitude. So, so Mr. Goodlook says, how was he allowed to leave the island without paying? Well, honey child, he was not in the Cayman Islands. Let me make this very, very clear. He sued me whilst being abroad. Hired Cayman law firm priestlies to do his dirty work for him. Yeah? Even now these trumped up criminal charges, he is not in this jurisdiction. He's in the United States of America 
calling the police and filing a report, I guess, over the phone. I guess they took his statement over the phone. This is the foolishness that is permitted to happen. He's not even in the jurisdiction. You can believe that? Yeah. So he, was, he wasn't here. He left in 2019 after he got fired from Cayman Leasing and Automotive by Randy Marin. And he's been gone since then. He couldn't pay his status, his PR, residency, whatever they call it these days. So, of course, that was given back because he couldn't afford it. And he left the jurisdiction in 2019. No job, no post prospects, whatever. So he's been living back in Maryland all this time. Now they go on and take his little house from him. Oh, Lord Jesus. He's a con artist. Anyway, let's talk about better things. Caymanians are some amazing people. And we have got to keep it that way. That's why I don't like what these politicians are up to. We have an obligation to keep our legacy intact. Yes. And to ensure that the history that this country, that the history of hardworking people, people who made sacrifices for their families, they went out to sea, they went on dangerous trips and voyages and all this kind of stuff. They were honest, give you a good day's work for a decent salary. These are some of the things that have historically been part of who we are as a people. We can't afford to allow that to go by the wayside for nobody. No politician, no Johnny come late Liz, and no Caymanians either. I don't care who you are. We must try to raise up our standards a bit and remember from whence we came. So these Cayman Voices series, folks, I am so tickled pink to be able to offer you a glimpse, an insight into the lives of our elders so you can understand, especially our young people. Because a lot of them, the reason why they so easily adopt other cultures is because they don't have a clue about their own. So when someone tells them, oh, okay, man, I got no culture, this, that, and the next thing, of course they believe that because they don't know Nobody not taught them no Cayman in history. So they accept everything that comes across the border with open arms. They have an identity crisis. Look at this picture here. This is Mr. Andrew, John Andrew Eden, and his grandfather, his grandfather's wagon, which this was taken in the 1950s, in front of the old market in Georgetown. These men and women are sons and daughters of the Caymanian soil. They are our ancestors, our aunts, our uncles, our grandparents, our forefathers, our parents. And most of them deserve a lot of respect for the sacrifices that they made. They, they weren't perfect. They didn't live a perfect life. Yes, even back in those days, they were all kind of sus in the original Ma Road and whatever. But a lot of them earned their positions in society. They're philanthropic. They're out there, you know, Lions members committing to the community. They're JPs, they give back. They help others. And so it is incumbent on us that we know who they are, we know their stories, and we share these stories. So I am going out every single month. We air two interviews. You have suggestions for people I should interview, by all means, send it to me. It's amazing the things that our people have done, and we don't appreciate it. We don't know. We don't have a clue. We have to keep this alive. <laughs> DJ, you you're so CMR blazing up the fire this morning. Getting the country weekend ready mode, my goodness. 
So I had a real, uh, what exactly was our culture again? Well, um, Jonathan, get your cup of tea, sit back and listen. Because you're going to get a snippet again from another Caymanian. Let me thank our corporate sponsors. And listen, we anybody can come on board as a sponsor for the program. Please contact us. We appreciate it. It makes it possible for us to go out there and do what we have to do. But I think, Mr. Andrew, uh, it, it, it's a bit of a um, invasion isn't the right word that I'm looking for, but an intrusion perhaps a little bit into their lives. You know, they answer questions. They never know what's coming. I don't, I don't write out questions. I don't, you know, we talk freely. And they're always willing to share. And to me, that's just amazing, right? So please sit back and enjoy. Cayman Voices was a dream that I had for several years now. It's about taking the power of storytelling to embrace our own collective history as a people. Through our individual stories, we're able to see the common thread that binds us together as one. One person's personal journey has become our collective culture, heritage, and history. This series will show people from all walks of life sitting down with me as the host and going through their life journey. Sometimes there are unknown elements of their lives, but ultimately we're going to walk away having learned something new with every person that we sit down with. I guess I would explain it as an exploration of our story. I'm naturally curious about people and their lives. So Came on Voices is exciting and allows me to capture this for everyone to enjoy. We are seeking out Caymanians, multi-generational, as well as some who have moved here to, you know, uproot their entire lives and to make this their home. This dream would not be possible without some sponsorship, and so I'd like to thank the DART organization for stepping up to the plate uh, to ensure that we're able to deliver regular monthly content for our viewers to enjoy. So sit back, kick up your feet, turn up the radio, relax, and listen to Cayman Voices. The University College of the Cayman Islands, the nation's premier provider of post-secondary education, is proud to support Cayman Voices, transforming the lives of Cayman residents. All right, so we are really tickled pink to be doing another segment of Cayman Voices. And today we find ourselves in the beautiful district of Savannah with Mr. James Andrew Eden, better known as just Mr. Andrew. Everybody knows him um, by that name or Mr. Eden. Uh, Long standing member of the Seafarers Association, of course. He's very, very active in the community. And as I came into his sort of home office here, I see so much amazing equipment behind him and I gotta be honest with you Mr. Andrew I don't know what half of this stuff is <laughs> I see some computer screens but tell me what is all of this stuff well uh, this is my hobby I'm a amateur radio operator mm -hmm. also known as a ham radio operator and uh, this is one of the things I got into it during my seafaring career right and uh, ham radio is uh, is a hobby, but it'd be how over 2 million people worldwide that have a set up like this at their house and mm -hmm. all around the country and all that. And uh, I got into this uh, after I was sailing a chief engineer with no hire to, to go on board ship. So I decided I was going to study for a, for a radio operator license because those mm -hmm. days the ships, that's how they communicated by Morse code over a, radio so mm -hmm. then I did some studying and uh, and uh, then I found a magazine on amateur radio and I said wow well this is the way to go mm -hmm. and uh, started studying my ham radio uh, license and finally I got to take the exam when I was home uh, one trip in uh, 1978 wow and after that, I used to communicate back home every day from the board the ship, mm -hmm. no matter what part of the world I was. Mm. And uh, I had a friend on Seven Mile Beach who was a 
he was the manager of uh, one of the condos there, mm -hmm. and he was a ham radio operator. So from out there, I used to talk with people all over the world all the time. It's a right. fascinating hobby. Wow. So tell me, what does ham stand for something? Well, it's just uh, the claim it came from home amateur mechanic was where it started. Oh. Nobody knows for sure. Uh -huh. It's been it's been on for uh, so long, but yes. so we just call hams. Yes. And uh, you know okay. it. And then, so this radio, it's just a way of communicating with each other. Or are you playing music? Like what? What exactly are you doing on it? No, it's just things personal. Mm -hmm. And uh, where it really comes in best are like times of disaster, like hurricanes yes. or earthquakes and things like that. Uh -huh. uh, you know, we communicated with the disaster areas. And like the, the hurricane center in Miami, we, we report weather reports back to them directly mm -hmm. from our stations. And, uh, you know, it, it's a great way of uh, them learning what's going on right in the area that these things are happening. Mm-hmm. So these ham radio stations have frequencies just like a regular FM radio? Yeah, but we have many different modes of communicated, oh. communicating. We communicate in Morse code, wow. voice by uh, uh, like radio telephone. We have loads of different communicating uh, digital modes we communicate with. And we have many frequencies to operate on. We operate everything from down in the uh, medium frequency mm -hmm. up into all the way to light you mm -hmm. know we communicate through satellites and uh, we have repeaters mm -hmm. that we communicate through locally around the island here wow because we have uh, medium frequency uh hf vhf uhf uh, all the different bands and mm -hmm. uh, you know it's uh, it's something for everybody it's mm -hmm. uh, some people like communicating we can even send pictures where we uh where we anywhere okay. we talk we can send a photograph or whatever you know it's uh wow. and then for local we have which we don't have any in the island here where there is a re like regular tv mm -hmm. like all over the u.s they have that but we don't have any stations here that we can mm -hmm. send live tv like in case of disaster and all of that oh wow that sounds quite fascinating so are you the, is there like an association on island that does ham radio or are you pretty much a one man show for that here? No, in actually there's about four of us on the island. Oh wow. Okay. But there's only a handful that are active mm -hmm. and we have a nice little uh, amateur radio club called the Cayman Amateur Radio Society. Okay. We, we, we meet once a month at the uh, Red Cross building mm -hmm. and uh, recently we got two new hams in Cayman Brack. Mm -hmm. And because uh, we, Offreg, who does the licensing, mm -hmm. they uh, authorize our, our amateur society to examine the people mm -hmm. in order. When, so when we pass a test, we send a notice to the Offreg and mm -hmm. they will uh, issue them a call sign. Because it just seemed like a name. Everyone has an amateur radio call sign. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, my call sign locally is. Mm -hmm. ZF1EG or Zulu Fox 1 Echo Juliet because we use mm. phonetics all the time on mm -hmm. the radio mm. which I am also licensed in the US and mm -hmm. when I was board ship I had a Liberian license that's a EL0AV and uh, mm. because the ships were Liberian registered that I sail on so mm -hmm. I had to use a Liberian call sign Wow I mean, you learn something new every day because I didn't know there was an association. And then you've got so many members. Now, are some of your members a little bit on the older side or young people getting interested in this as well? Well, luckily, recently, the two young guys we got, you know, they're in their uh, early 30s, which mm. is great. Wonderful. And uh, over the years, we've had a number of... Uh, of people go through, but usually mm -hmm. they're here for a short time and then mm -hmm. they... Uh, they move on, mm -hmm. but uh, you know a lot of the older guys that uh, like Gorni Patton, Carl Gadet, and uh, Sparks Handelon, and some of those guys have passed mm -hmm. on and left us. But we still have, uh, you know, quite a few on the island, but not mm -hmm. very many uh, active. For instance, Lenny Hugh, you know, he's mm -hmm. still an amateur radio operator, although he's mm -hmm. not very active these days. Okay. But uh, we try to encourage people to get going and. We have a station outside and a little mm -hmm. shack outside that I get 
amateurs come down from all over the world to operate amateur radio from the wow. island here. And you mentioned that there is an examination process. So this isn't something, I mean, the, the equipment looks quite technical, so you can't just sit down and know what you're doing. You have to learn really how to use the equipment and how this entire thing works. That is correct. We have, uh, you know, we have local regulations, we have international regulations, we're guided by the ITU, we have to go by all their regulations. Mm -hmm. So all of those things are incorporated into one mm -hmm. and we have to, uh, you know, learn a bit about electricity, radios and uh, all the regulations, both local and international, that we must abide by. Mm -hmm. And we are real a self-policing -pol community, mm -hmm. you know, worldwide, hey, anyone makes a mistake, someone is there to grab them and mm -hmm. put them on the right path. Uh, right. You know, it is, uh, it is very well organized worldwide. Wow, that's quite amazing. Hmm. All right, well, um, you know, Mr. Andrew, of course, you're a staple here in um, Savannah, Pedro Road area. I guess you probably grew up here your entire life. So let's go back in time a little bit. Uh, tell us a little bit um, about your childhood. Do you mind telling us how old you are? <laughs> Most people don't mind. Oh, no, um, no. 74 years of old. 74 years young. <laughs> well, whatever you want to call it, but the 74 years of age, anyway. Yes, yes. So what was life like um, when you were born and, and was growing up? Did you have a lot of siblings? Maybe tell us a little bit about who your parents were as well. Okay, well, actually, I born and grew up 200 feet from where we're sitting. Wow. Right next door, it was where I was born. Those days, there was no hospital to go to. Yes. Hey, everybody was, was born at home back wow. then. Wow, yes. And, uh, you know, gee, well, I always said I never was a kid because I had to walk like heck from time I, I could walk. Mm -hmm. You know, we raised a lot of cattle and, uh, mm -hmm. hey, every morning I had to get out and milk the cows and uh, draw water for them because there was mm -hmm. no pumps. You had to bail water out of the well. Mm -hmm water the cattle mm -hmm. in the evening, bring them back to the pen, pen the calves, and uh, hey, milking them in the morning and the mosquitoes was unbearable. The mm -hmm. mosquitoes, mm -hmm. you could grab them out of the air like that. Oh my goodness. It oh was, my gosh. You know, sometimes it even used to suffocate some of the cattle. The mosquitoes yes. were so thick. Oh my goodness. And uh, I went to school just down the road here, the Savannah Primary School. Mm -hmm. I went through that and I passed the first year Jamaica local exam. Let me, let me ask you a question now. Where Savannah Primary is located now? Is that where the, the schoolyard when you were growing up more or less was located as well? Yes, but it wasn't the size it is yes, now. Yeah. You know, with just a little building that's still there, the one in front. Which is now the post the little post office. No. No. It's right next to the post office. Little building where is... Uh, ah. Ah, for some reason, I thought that used to be the old post office. No, the old that post... That was the original schoolhouse then. Uh, the little building in front of the post mm -hmm. office. The one right in front of the school itself is, I think it's the National Trust or someone that, that takes care of that now. Right. It was a one-class uh, school room for all the children from Savannah, Newlands, Lower Valley, all mm -hmm. in this area here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's... We had two teachers, Teal and McCoy, and uh, mm -hmm. Corian uh, Wood, which was was Corian Borden initially, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, you know we went through from book one, book two, and then standard one up to standard six. Mm -hmm. Once you completed that, then you took the uh, the first year Jamaica. They had three Jamaica local exams. They call them mm -hmm. first, second, and third year. I passed the first year and then I moved on to the place in town was called the Jamaica Local Center, mm -hmm. which they taught you uh, the second year and the third year. Mm -hmm. hey, I was only there for about six months and really didn't like it, so I moved on to Triple C and then okay. went through uh, high school at Triple C. Mm. Okay. And this Jamaican Local Center, is that close to where the public library is no, no, that is where they call the annex. Uh, yes. It was right on one portion of that, right next to the the uh, Georgetown Primary School. It was called. Okay. Oh, I forgot the exact name it was back then, mm -hmm. but it was two schools on that compound where they call oh. the annex today. Yes, yes, I see. So, did you have any siblings growing up? 
Yes, uh, mm -hmm. two brothers, two sisters. Okay. And uh, and where where did you fall in the line of? Um, <laughs> were you the youngest in between? I am the eldest. You're I am the, the eldest. Yes, I am the eldest. Okay. And uh, one sister has passed on a number of years ago, but yes. uh, I still have uh, two brothers and a sister that's with right. me. Right. And of course, I'm sure back in those days, being the eldest, there was a lot of responsibility, probably more um, so placed on you. Did your parents expect you talk about, you know, working the land really? Um, so I'm guessing this is pretty much all farmland in those days, but did your parents expect a lot out of you? You said you didn't have much of a childhood because you felt like from early on it was like, okay, get to work. This is what's expected to help the family. Yeah, it was, it was rough going, but hey, mm -hmm. we survived and uh, we yeah. enjoyed life no matter what. Yes. Uh, you know, especially going to school over here. Uh, my little sister was five years younger than me. I had to take care of her because we went mm -hmm. to the same school together. The other ones came later and uh, mm -hmm. I didn't have any schools along with them. Right. And, uh, you know, then initially uh, after I moved to town to go to high school, mm -hmm. then my sister, she moved to a different school also, and uh, we all grew, advanced separately then. Mm -hmm. And when you when you mentioned that you moved to town, that means then that you weren't going back and forth between Savannah every day to school. You were actually living in town while you were going to school? No, we went to school. Someone took us to school, you, ah. our uncles or someone, and uh, mm -hmm. took us to school every day. And, uh, okay. you know, it's... Uh, it was a long ride. Sometimes you had to catch a ride with someone else who would carry you. And uh, mm -hmm. then later, later years, then we had a bus service, which was great. You know, mm -hmm. we had two people in the shell with bus service, Mr. Cradock uh, uh, Ebanks from mm -hmm. North Side and uh, Mr. Whitaker, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Ormond Whitaker. They were the first two with bus service for the school kids, which was great. And mm -hmm. uh, hey, that was better than riding in the back of a truck all the time. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. But even before those days, you know, uh, I used to ride to town with my grandfather. He had a horse and buggy mm. that uh, pulled the wagon to town. Actually, mm -hmm. I have a picture of it up in the corner there. Oh, we'll look at that here in a second. And, wow. Uh, you know, every... Every Saturday, I went to town with him. You know, we used uh -huh. to carry firewood and uh, used to carry mangoes to sell and give away to people. Wow. And uh, also, even red mold sometimes, he used to load up the wagon with that and, mm -hmm. and haul it to town. Red mold? Yeah. What is what the is that? The soil from the, the Suwannee soil. area. Oh, Georgetown, okay. they have a different type of soil, you know. Here we have yes. red soil in the area. Yes. so. People like that for, for planting. For planting yeah. Yes, uh huh. Because this area is known more to be a little bit more in the farming side and grow a lot of different crops and stuff like that. Right, and he carried a lot of firewood, you know, because those days everyone mm -hmm. used a caboose or a, mm -hmm. or a wood stove, you know, so. And right. also fence poles, he used to cut the logwood, carry down for fence poles for people. Okay, wow, interesting. Now tell me a little bit, um, obviously you've got this last name, Eden, which is a Caymanian name. We know the Edens kind of from this area, Pedro Castle and so on. But who who were your parents? And you mentioned your grandfather as well. Tell us a little bit about, um, you know, who, who you found, who you, <laughs> who are your people? <laughs> <laughs> okay, my, my grand, one of my grandfather was um, Selvin Eden, which okay. was very well known mm -hmm. back then. Uh, he took care of a lot of things. The government, for instance, they had to pound there to put the cattle in. If they found them stray on the street, you had mm -hmm. to pay a penny to get your cow out if you got in jail. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. he, he used to run the cattle dip, you know, oh, okay. where, you know, to keep the ticks off. You had to, every few weeks, you had to bring them all your cattle and oh. they jump in the water and uh, kill uh -huh. the ticks, you know. Hmm. And uh, the other grandfather was Dursley Jackson. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did most of farming and and uh, mm -hmm. rearing cattle mainly for the uh, the marines. Right. Okay. And uh, one grandmother the, from my Eden side, she was a stay at home, and mm -hmm. my grandmother from uh, my mother's side, uh, you know, she went around helping people all over the island and was a stay at home mom also. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I was raised uh, by my mother and uh, my stepfather actually. My uh -huh. mother was Corinne Jackson, then Eden, uh -huh. and my father's Woodrow Eden. I uh, was raised by my stepfather who uh -huh. was Tan Eden as most everyone knew him. Okay. But uh, mm -hmm. overall, we had a pretty good life, you know. I, mm -hmm. Even from a kid, my uncles, they had a bottle water factory in Georgetown. I used to go down there, help them all the time, mm -hmm. making soft drinks. Because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. at, at one point, we haven't gotten there in your story yet, but at one point, you actually owned a bottled water company as well. Yeah, that was after I retired from sea. I had okay. a bottled water company here, so on the springs. So, yeah, so your knowledge came from a very young age, seeing your uncles in that business. Oh, yeah, you know, I, I enjoyed, uh, mm -hmm. you know, bottling the sodas. We had many different flavors of soda they used to produce, so right in the center of Georgetown, mm. actually right next to where was the uh, Marin's Drake, right across from Kentucky, where was in town. Mm. The one okay. by on uh, Shaden Road. Yes. Uh huh. And uh, that was right across in the actual the parking lot used by Coconuts now. Okay, so that was um, they actually had like a little bottling. They had a very nice setup there. I mean, mm. for the time, it was very well automated. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well, you know, the bottles they, they were cleaned by hand force, mm -hmm. and then they went through a sterilizing machine. Mm -hmm. Then came on, you put the bottle into the. Uh, the, the filling machine and it went around with all the process when it came out it was already filled and capped you know for back mm. then uh, mm -hmm. it was you know exceptionally uh, uh, good setup they had mm -hmm. there it was owned by my uncles Crosby Eden and Lindborg Eden hmm. interesting huh. never knew that I tell you what it's such such amazing history that we have um, or amongst our people, you know, that, that, um, that's really, really fascinating. So you did that, um, you started to grow into being a young man. I mean, back in those days, of course, a lot of our young men went to sea. So at what point did you, were you actually interested in going to sea or, or was it just what everybody did at the time? Well, it was something I really wanted to do from mm -hmm. time I was a kid, you know, cause mm -hmm. I had a bunch of uncles, my father and all, they were all all engineers mm. and uh, you know I grew up working on machinery all around here mm -hmm. and uh, from time I was about oh, 11 12 years old I used to operate bulldozers and all that with my uncle mm -hmm. but they were in the heavy equipment business mm -hmm. and uh, when I got of age I started driving trucks for them mm -hmm. hauling fill all over the island mm -hmm. uh, so I was very interested in work all sorts of machinery all of my life and mm -hmm. my craving was to go to sea. Mm -hmm. All right, so what, at what stage then did you make that happen? Well, uh, at the age of 17, mm -hmm. you know, hey, Miss Gwen got the call. She wanted a new crew for a ship up in Portland, Maine. They would, mm -hmm. for the ship for National Ball Carriers, they were chaining the crew from Spaniards and wanted mainly Caymanians. Mm -hmm. So 17 of us uh, left the island here mm -hmm. in 1966 to join the uh, DMRS in Portland, Maine. Mm -hmm. That was the beginning of my seafaring career. Wow. And we know that national bolt carriers um, had quite an amazing relationship with Caymanian seamen. And it seems like they preferred um, Caymanians. Why do you think that is? Well, they were hardworking men. Mm -hmm. They really understood seamanship. Mm -hmm. My only downfall I saw with a lot of them, they were so much better than others that were above them mm. out there, and they didn't advance enough as we should have. Mm -hmm. But when I went out there, I decided, hey, I'm going to make the best of it. Mm -hmm. So the minute I got out there, I got some engineering books, started studying, and mm -hmm. uh, hey, in less than no time, I was on my way up the ladder. Very good. So even even in those days, having that certification, that knowledge, that piece of paper, as young people would say, was really important, even as a seaman. Oh, certainly, you had to have uh, you had to obtain an engineer's license or a mate's license in order to work your way up, mm -hmm. along with the experience, you know, mm -hmm. working aboard ship. 
And the thing was that uh, they gave you every opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, once you're out there and want to progress and you do your studying, they would even send you to school in New York, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to uh, further your education, to mm -hmm. uh, become an engineer. And, uh, you know, a lot of people took advantage of it, but mm -hmm. a lot of people did not that should have. Mm -hmm. True. Very amazing. So uh, tell us a little bit then about what your um, time was on ship. What did you find most interesting about, um, you know, being away and what countries did you get an opportunity to visit? Well, uh, board ship, uh, you know, you get used to it. Mm -hmm. My fourth ship, I was on 26 months. Wow. The next one was 27 months. Mm -hmm. So the fourth ship, you know, I... Uh, I started out as a mess man mm -hmm. and uh, making $132 a month. Mm -hmm. Hey, that was a lot better than $2 a day I was, make, I was making here uh, driving a truck. Uh, mm -hmm. So, hey, decided to go for it. And uh, mm -hmm. then I was six months as a mess man and I moved up to wiper in the engine room. And I was only wiper for six weeks and then they gave a promotion to Mm -hmm. Second pump one engine maintenance, mm -hmm. and uh, so I gained a tremendous amount of experience uh, mm -hmm. during that time. And uh, like I say, with the on hand experience mm -hmm. and then studying non stop day and night, hey, uh, on my very next ship, then I, I started my engineer's license. That's amazing. So, um, I mean, you, you started out <laughs> really at the bottom, you would say. Yeah, no doubt sure. about it. Yeah. Right. Washing good. dishes and making up beds and, mm -hmm. uh, hey, serving food, mm -hmm. all those kind of things. That I was right at the bottom. So. Yes, yes. Very good. What were some of the countries you went to um, on the first stint? abroad and uh, what did you think when you first started to go to these countries? I mean obviously Cayman must have been very different than some of the places you visited. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, they were much different uh, but the thing was everywhere you went mm -hmm. you, you met people and mm -hmm. you find out is overall there's not a whole lot of difference. We, uh, we, we become friends mm -hmm. with everyone everywhere you mm -hmm. went and uh, you know uh, some ships we had up to 40 different nationalities on board the same on one mm -hmm. ship you know so mm -hmm. it is uh you get to learn the the ways of other people and you know mm -hmm. some places were nicer than others for instance like holland you know everybody speaks english you know, mm -hmm. in that country mm -hmm. denmark where well, the people were so friendly it was just unbelievable mm -hmm. and uh you know, it, I visit many countries all over Europe, uh, mm -hmm. the Middle East, and, uh, you know, going through places like the Suez Canals was mm -hmm. fascinating. And, for instance, in 1967, we had just passed through that uh, three hours before mm -hmm. they closed the canal during the, uh, mm -hmm. the uh, Six-Day War, you know, in 1967. Wow. Uh, so we were lucky just to get in. Some of the ships were caught in there. You know, they were there for many years. Some of them yeah. even sank down in there during that period of time. Oh, my gosh. So That's amazing. It was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have any sort of um, danger at sea on the high sea? Or was it pretty much relatively safe I mean safe is obviously well <laughs> it's relatively safe but gee uh, I yeah. had a few experiences for instance just after joining the ship mm -hmm. I remember this uh, I went through my notes here a couple of days ago I had from board that ship mm -hmm. and January 9th 1967 you know I was in the uh, mess hall preparing for breakfast for mm -hmm. to serve the officers I was officer messman all of a sudden and the fire alarm goes on. Oh my mm -hmm. goodness, I jump out of the passage to go get my life jacket mm -hmm. and the whole place is completely full of smoke. Mm. Oh my, well, nobody knew what was wrong or whatever, mm -hmm. so everyone, you know, be mustered to a station you were in times like that. Mm -hmm. I uh, grabbed my life jacket and I pounded on the door for my 
uncle uh, portion mayor and he because I know he was a hard sleeper mm -hmm. woke him up and then I head up to the uh, to the the boat deck mm -hmm. while we were up there uh, you know on the boat deck they had probably about 50 empty 55 gallon lube oil drums and from the heat in the engine room, the whole deck popped up through the drums in the air. Mm -hmm. And when they draw back down, you all scared everyone to death. We thought that was the end of us. Oh, my gosh. Luckily, we had one guy from Cayman, Peter Truhecki, who was the idler and watch. Uh -huh. He stayed down there and got the fire out, you know, because uh -huh. when I was going out to get my life jacket, the engineer, he was coming out. He was a Belgium guy. He was running out of the engine room. He's gone. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Luckily, Peter stayed there wow. and, uh, you know, got the fire out after a while. Yes. So that was the most Amazing. most harrowing situation that I saw my whole time out yeah. there. It was really scary. Yeah. It's interesting because you said your uncle was on, on this voyage with you. You talked about this um, gentleman, Peter, who saved the ship really and probably saved a lot of lives as yep. well. So you had a lot of people from Cayman that you would have known or if you didn't know them before, you got to know them at sea. Oh, yeah, certainly. Well, actually, I had a couple of fa uh, family members, you know, uh, uh, my uncle, Portion Marin, mm -hmm. my cousin, Nimitz Ebanks, another cousin from North Side. Paul uh, Ebanks, mm -hmm. you probably know him. He was a construction guy in recent mm -hmm. years. And uh, I knew all the other guys, actually, several from West Bay, a few from Kim and Brack and mm -hmm. uh, Georgetown. So, hmm. you know, it was interesting. And yes. we were like a big family board yes. there. I'm sure it made life a little bit more bearable. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. And, uh, you know, well, once you get the hang of it, it doesn't matter who you sail with after that, you mm -hmm. you feel the same. Yeah, you're, you're a pro then at it. <laughs> <laughs> so how many years in total then were you um, away at sea? Uh, almost 17 years, and most of that time was spent at sea, you know. Did you say 7 or 17? 17. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, oh my. you know, a lot of my trips, three of my trips were there were two years each time. Mm. Sometime I come home for a couple of weeks. I remember one time I'd been gone over two years. I came home, I was home two days. And wow. they called me to relieve a guy down Cape Town, South Africa, who was mm -hmm. sick. And they, well, they wouldn't have called me if they didn't need me. So mm -hmm. we decided as a duty to, to the uh, company, you know, mm -hmm. to go whenever they call. So mm. that's amazing. And um, what what would have been your port of entry? Did you normally go from Cayman to Miami, New York, Texas? What was the route that you normally took? Depends on where the ship yeah. was. You know, I joined ships in Portland, Maine. I've joined them in Rotterdam. I joined them in Dubai. I joined them in mm -hmm. Japan. I joined them in Cape Town, South Africa. Mm -hmm. All over the world, you know, we flew from mm -hmm. time to time. And we sailed all around the world. Mm. That is so amazing. So, um, amazingly, you mentioned that you had referred to a little notebook to refresh your memory with certain things. Have you been keeping a journal, notes? Tell us a little bit about what you've got here in your archives. Well, you know, I know I did save a lot, but mm -hmm. for my first trip in anyway, I saved a, a few things. Mm -hmm. And this was some of the crew members that we joined the uh, DMRS in 1966. Wow. So the D DM Mars was the name of the ship. Correct. And then you've got all these Caymanians. You have Helen Dilbert, Robert Bodden, Pershing Marin. Who this Peter Truhecki. Truhecki. That's the one that you were just talking about? Yeah, that's the guy okay. that saved us. Wow. Rudolph Manderson, Weldon Anderson, so Nemitz Ebanks. Lots of very familiar names on here. Yep. For sure, and then their positions on right. the ship. So junior engineers, oilers, you had a chief stu steward, um, chief chef, or sorry, chief cook, second cook, and so on. So this is quite an amazing list. Now, this young man that saved the lives, his last name is a little bit different. Where Do you have any idea where he was 
Chujaki, where, where was he from? Yeah, he was uh, originally from Belize, ah. but he came here working for uh, Mr. Kofel on the uh, power, power, power station they had in the island here. Okay. And uh, many years after he retired from mm -hmm. sea, then he moved back to uh, Belize. Ah. And more than likely he has passed on now because yes. he's been quite old. But I actually I met him in Belize, Belize about uh, probably about 15 years ago. Wow. And uh, he was still doing okay, but mm -hmm. quite old at that time. But, yes. you know, we, we remain uh, good friends mm -hmm. all his life. Yeah. I noticed that that name stood out because I thought, I haven't seen that name in Cayman, so I was wondering, yeah. Yeah, he was married to a lady from town, mm -hmm. and he has a daughter, I think. She lived in the U.S., but she has now moved to Belize. That's mm -hmm. the last I heard from her. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't remember what his wife's name was, mm -hmm. Hmm. but, uh, you know, he was a good friend of mine. Because yes. he and I actually, we sailed on a couple of ships together. Okay. Wow. Amazing. All right, what's this little booklet here then? Yeah, I had, you know, just a couple little notes yes. of uh, some of the airlines have flown wow. and uh, the the trip, you, you know, some of the countries I visited and all that, you can you can take yes. a quick, quick so, glance. So, so this you've had since 1966. Yeah. I mean, look, look at this, folks. So this NS um, Frank and Son Limited, that is, were those your uncles? No, is that? Uh, oh no, that's in Rodden. Oh no, 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 no that's, that's, that's something Rodden. altogether. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you had your little calendar here. Look at this, folks. From 1968, that's the 1968 calendar. 1966. There. Uh, um, when I, but he uh, was, started yeah. my record. So he wrote. Oh yes, because it has 66. Oh, I see how they did it. Oh, that's interesting. Look at the little. I'm gonna just show people here how the book is done. So in the back, they've got 1966, 67, 68. So you got like a little three-year calendar in there. And then um, this is a port, is this in Europe? Rotterdam Center. Yeah. And then this is like a little map and stuff there. But you use this then as your little book that you keep on the ship to kind of write down stuff. Yeah, very nice handwriting, I must say. <laughs> hey, you had to learn to write to learn properly proper. in school then, otherwise you get your knuckles cracked. That was one of Theolyn McCoy, or teacher. <laughs> she was she adamant insisted. you had to... Write properly. Yeah, so look at that. So these are some of the countries. Read out some of those countries of crew members. Um, there, he worked. Yeah, the country people. of crew members. I sailed during during my time in the DMR is Grand Cayman, Cayman Brac, Turks Island, Saint Vincent, Colombia, Ecuador, France, Belgium, Spain. Portugal and the Portuguese islands, Jamaica, Yugoslavia, Norway, wow. Laos, Greece, Germany, Holland, Indonesia, Iceland, mm. Turkey, Arabia, Argentina, Austria, Tenerife, wow. Finland, Poland, Suriname, British Guyana, Trinidad. Wow. That was during my 26 months, the yes. different nationalities I sailed with uh, aboard that ship. And I mean, you talk about the importance of, you know, you got along, along with everyone. Obviously, you had Caymanians there, you had non Caymanians. It was almost sounds like a little mini UN. <laughs> with all those countries represented, but you just learnt to get along with people well, from all certainly, over. yeah, you know we had we had to make it no matter mm -hmm. what you know some were loading ports on that ship aside the Libya, coral mayor mm -hmm. in Iraq, mm -hmm. Rasinore, Arabia, Karg Island, uh, Iran, mm -hmm. Bania, Syria. Sidon, Lebanon, Citra, Bahrain, and uh, through the Persian mm -hmm. Gulf to get to these ports of the time. Discharging ports uh, while on the DMR is La Vera, France, Rotterdam, Holland, 
Kallenborg, Denmark, Melazzo, Sicily, Eingelby, England, Bronze Budelkug, Germany, mm. Genoa, Italy, Tenerife in the Canary Islands, Portland, Maine, Isle of Green in England, Pembroke, England, Whitegate, Ireland, Botany Bay, Sydney, Australia, some were wow. discharged ports during yes. that. And when time. you got discharged, I've seen these from my uncle uh, Raymond Barnes. You got a little dis discharge. They gave us a discharge. So took it for your time yes. on board the ship. Yes, I've seen those. Now, that's a lot of countries, that's a lot of nationalities. And as you were reading them, off i was thinking to myself it, it's so interesting that now we are supposedly more advanced but yet the majority of caymanians haven't probably interacted with as many people and they certainly haven't traveled to all those places in the world um i think that you guys got a real hands-on life lesson in, in diversity and culture just because in those, those days that's just how it was yeah no doubt about it and it was a great ex experience and hey this was only on one sh ship you know mm -hmm. I sailed uh, you know on 11 different ships mm -hmm. and uh, you know it's yeah. it's I've seen at one time a crew of 55 uh, on some ships. We had up to 40 different nationalities at the wow. same time on on one ship. So, so it's almost like every other every person was we, from somewhere else. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. You know, it, we we had to make it. Yeah, you know, no matter what. And how did you? get over the language barriers were there any issues with that just about everyone speaks english uh -huh. you know otherwise uh, they they wouldn't get it to come you find right. an odd one that really couldn't uh yeah speak very good but hey they did enough to mm -hmm. to make it anyway mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very interesting Interesting. Anything else? You got your little goodies of archives over there that you might want to pull up for us? Because this is like a history. Oh my. Um, oh my goodness. Well, tell us a little bit then. Um, we've talked about some of your seafaring days. Do you have any pictures of yourself from back in those days? You know, I would not. Now we're into photography, okay. but, but I. I have a few, although I'm, I, I've never been organized. Okay. And, uh, okay. you know, it, when it comes to photography, mm -hmm. and uh, I was just starting to try to organize some things, and then yes. you, you jumped on top of me, and, <laughs> and there, that, that was it. Yeah. For instance, hey, you really can't see them, but this is a photograph of two helicopters aboard a ship at the same time. Wow. But, but I just got an arrow showing you where they were, but, but you know, yes. you really couldn't see them. And this, this would have been when? How, how long? That, that was in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh-huh. Wow. But, we used to uh, we used to go there and we used to anchor off. Wow, that ship looks huge. A hundred miles offshore. Yes, you see the little arrows there. They're kind of hard to see, but trust me, that's a really big ship. I, I think I have another one with a helicopter. Yeah. Somewhere here. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And these are some of the ships then that you yeah, would have been. Yeah, the, these are some of the ships I sailed on. But I, I got them 
small up there that you know yes. you can pan around okay. and, and yeah, see them. Absolutely. I mean, what what what's the size of these ships? I mean, these. Oh, Okay. Uh, the largest I was on, it, which was a few of them, mm -hmm. was 1138 feet long. Wow. The, the, the later ones that we were on, which were the newer ships, they were a little smaller. They were 1103 feet long. Mm. But, uh, uh, mm, pretty, pretty good size. Uh, Ooh. Wow. Uh, this, this is the interesting photograph. Well, it's kind of beat up, but the Interbank, they did a, a film about the Cayman Islands, and mm -hmm. that was filmed in, uh, in Bantra Bay, Ireland. Mm. Uh, you might recognize him, but I'm the little guy you see in the... Uh, in the middle there. Oh, that's you with the plaid, looks like a plaid shirt on? And ah! <laughs> my, my uncle Lee Jackson was a chief engineer. Uh -huh. I was second engineer and Leroy, Leroy Ebanks was third engineer and Roger Good, ah. the director of the... Uh, so you're your movie uh, star too, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness, who knew, who knew? That's so amazing. Truly amazing. And, you know, interesting also, you know, uh, he, my wife sailed with me also when I was board ship. Really? So this was possible for her to, to sh um, Oh, yes. Oh. oh she she wow. sailed with me for five years. And uh, sometime wow. nine, ten months of the year, she was aboard ship with me. Oh, my goodness. Now, t tell us a little bit about your wife. Um, she's since passed, but... This is the two of you here in this picture? Yeah, that's the two of us. Wow, uh, look at that. We were having fire and boat drills, so we had on our life jackets, uh -huh. you see. I never knew that you could take a spouse along oh. on the ships. Oh, yes, yeah, certainly. Well, that certainly made life easier, I'm sure. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, it uh -huh. was very interesting. And, and this is you here again in this picture? Yeah, that's in the engine control room of one so. of the ships. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Look at that. Oh, well, yeah, I can see. You can see one here where the helicopter is coming board. Oh yes, the helicopter's landing right there. Yeah. And uh, once my wife joined the ship off Canary Islands, mm -hmm. and they had a high her down with a cable from the helicopter, you know, mm. and uh, that was that was exciting for her, you know. Oh yes! Wow. So she got to she got to experience the adventure being out to sea as well yeah, and you know we went a lot yeah. of places she could get ashore and i didn't get ashore at all for instance in kuwait you know i'm we could only we could only go to the uh, the seamans club which mm -hmm. was on the dock but she got the opportunity to go to kuwait city and all of that i didn't have that opportunity because being chief engineer i couldn't mm -hmm. uh, be away from the ship you know for long periods of time like mm -hmm. that well, tell us a little bit about, I mean, obviously, I think you're married for, oh my gosh, I forget how many years, many, many years. Tell us a little bit about um, your beautiful wife. Of course, I remember her. Um, really had a spunk <laughs> to her that's unforgettable. How did the two of, of you meet? She was from the Savannah area as well? No, she was from Georgetown. She was but, from Georgetown. You know, okay. hey, we met, she used to sell tickets at Island of Theater. It was, everyone mm -hmm. called it Berkeley Theater in town, you know. Uh -huh. and, so we met there when we were teenagers, and uh, mm -hmm. so I left home, you know, at 17, and we never met up again for five years later. Wow. And then a year after that, uh, we were married, mm -hmm. and uh, we were together, you know, almost four to seven years. Wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, she passed away four years ago, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, was, life was great mm -hmm. being being able to have your spouse on board ship with you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it was something that officers could do. And sometimes there was up to three or four women aboard the same ship, which mm -hmm. uh, made life uh, interesting for the, the wives also. Because mm -hmm. we were busy working during the day, and, uh, you know, they had a little company amongst themselves that right. uh, they enjoyed it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And whenever you docked at different ports, they could sometimes oh, yes. get off. and yeah. 
Yeah. Could always go ashore, you know, it was mm -hmm. never a problem. Right. Wow. And the only thing, like in the Persian Gulf, there's very few places you could go ashore there, but, you know, when you're right. in Europe especially, you know, mm -hmm. it, hey, everywhere you could get ashore. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So for five years she was a, a sea woman. <laughs> She yeah, to, that's right. And uh, yeah. hey, let me. I got her discharge here also. Oh wow! Prove that she did. She did go. Oh to, my goodness! I don't want that, but uh, you know. Uh, that's amazing. Okay. Yeah. So she got a little discharge slip yeah. too. Yeah, she's yeah. She was the, signed on as stewardess. You see. Ah, and, uh, look at that. Isn't that something? And they got a dollar a month for the time she was board oh, ship, really? you know. Yeah. <laughs> the Republic of Liberia, <laughs> Treasury Department. Wow. Uh, yeah, Miss Loretta. Bureau of Maritime Affairs. Hmm. I, I've never this is I've never heard anybody else mention this before, so I think that, that is so fascinating. Wow, look at that. She's only twenty two years old at the time. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, it's very interesting, and you know, she, the company treated us nice. You know, mm -hmm. the later years they even paid for the airfare for our wives to join us board ship. So, mm -hmm. you know, it was pretty nice. They kept you guys happy. Yep. Yeah. So, um, you served for seventeen years. So, how old would you have been then when you were finished with your seafaring career? I was thirty-four when I uh, wow. started on the seventeen. I was thirty-four when I retired from the sea. Yeah. Finally. Believe it or not, January the first two years ago, I found out how to retire. Now I am completely take, retired. Take easy. <laughs> no, dealing with seafarers, uh, uh, lions, and justice of the peace association. So mm -hmm. maybe more busy than ever, but uh, I'm happy that yes. uh, I can throw the phone down now and not have to worry about that right, ringing right. all the time. So what did you do when you uh, returned back home then? Um, are you one of the longest serving Cayman seamen? Cause no, 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 nothing like that. Gee, I'm one of the oh, young wow. ones. Really? I, okay. I, I have an uncle, Lee Jackson, that he was sailing mm. for over 40 years. Oh, wow. You know, okay. he was sailing chief engineer mm -hmm. before I went to sea. Wow. I went to sea for 17 years, mm -hmm. retired from sea, and he was out there. Still uh, doing it. Still doing it, you know, and many years later, before he because I retired end of 1982 mm -hmm. and he retired I think in 2000 or something like that hmm. you know and uh, my father was uh, so wait also a minute let, let me allow this to sink in for a second um even in the 80s the 90s and 2000s there, there were people still going out to sea on, oh, on ships oh yes uh, oh. I uh, I retired uh, you know the end of 1982 uh -huh. well what happened the company had laid up a lot of the ships Okay. Uh, actually, at the prime time, when I was out there, the company, we were operating 55 ships. Wow. When I left, there were two ships left in operation. Wow. Most of them, they had sold, but some of them were uh, laid up in different ports around the world. Mm -hmm. So they had a couple of members, a few crew members that were taking care of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was many years later before they brought back out some of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, then most of them were sold off to uh, Scandinavian company. And uh, mm -hmm. there was about three or four guys that st was still sailing mm -hmm. until, I guess, in the uh, early 2000s. Wow, that's quite amazing. Huh. All right, so you returned to Cayman, early 30s. Um, what did you do upon your return? What kind of work did you do? Well, uh, when I returned uh, in the way two and eighty three, I started a little uh, appliance parts and service business, mm. and uh, I did that for uh, three years. Then mm -hmm. I got a hold of uh, a company that was looking for someone to install a reverse osmosis desalination plant at the. Uh, Mm -hmm. What was the name of it at that time? And that was my my greed of will. It was, mm. oh my goodness. Anyway, they mm -hmm. they had uh, desal plants in other islands around the Caribbean. So right, I got the guy came down here and interviewed me, and mm -hmm. right away he picked me up off to uh, Bonaire mm -hmm. to work on the desal plant down there. Mm -hmm. Went there for a few weeks, and I came back home. Then I went to the factory in California. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, studied a lot about uh, uh, Treasure Island Resort was the name of that re Treasure, oh, Treasure Island Resort. Island, right, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, uh, they had purchased uh, these oil plants, so I went to the factory in California and you know, I built everything, everything electrical on that plant, all mm -hmm. the panels and everything. And uh, then we packed it all up in a container and shipped it down here. Myself and two other guys, mm -hmm. we installed that in 1986. Wow. Then I, I ran that for them for 30 years. Wow. And during that time, I started a bottled water factory here also, which I ran for 10 years. Okay. And I couldn't make any money out of that, so I decided to close it down. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't make a dollar out of something in 10 years, it's time to move on. So right. <laughs> everything is yes. still there, seems as I shut it down, you only yeah. just drop into pieces. Oh, wow. Okay. And then, fun. well, I was still in the desal business because mm -hmm. I, I used to operate a lot of plants all over the island. And because I started my own company in 1986 mm -hmm. uh, called Aqua Design. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. I kept going until uh, last year, then I, I sold that out and now mm -hmm. uh, trying to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So you've got one son. Um, most people know him as DJ Lynn, Lynn Byrne. And um, how old did you wait to have him when you completely returned from sea, so in your 30s? He was four years old when I uh, gave up the sea. That was one of the main things, you know. Yes. Hey, it's great to be a seaman. Mm -hmm. But then when you got a family, it's mm -hmm. a different thing, mm -hmm. you know. So once he was four years old and uh, I came home and I decided to try to make it here, mm -hmm. it was very difficult because, you know, at sea we're so disciplined mm -hmm. the way we work. I mean, everything is on time. Everything has to be done right. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. to come back and work here, I found it very difficult. Hmm. But I I fought through it and made it okay, and I'm mm -hmm. thankful that I did. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, of course, there'll be um, some people listening to this interview and reminiscing about, you know, their own experiences and their own life. And there are younger people um, who might hear of some of your struggles. You said, you know, coming home was an adjustment period, but you just stuck with it. Uh, what's what's some of the advice that you would give young people who sometimes like, oh, I don't know what I want to do with my life and... You know, they might seem a bit discouraged at times. The key thing about uh, doing something or whatever you want to do in life, you have to find something that, that you like to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to see, I learned it well, mm -hmm. and I trained everyone under me so that uh, I had life easy sailing as a chief engineer because everyone knew what mm -hmm. they had to do. I tried to teach everyone everything that I could Whereas you run into a lot of people, they didn't want to teach anyone mm. out there, and it made life difficult for them. Mm -hmm. I mean, the more I can teach someone, the better for me. So I had it quite easy as a chief engineer, mm -hmm. but above all, try to do your best at everything that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, you can excel at anything, no doubt about it, but mm -hmm. you have to like it, and you have to give it your best effort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I always said, after coming home here, hey, all these young people today, they should have to go to sea mm -hmm. for five years before they get a, la a job on shore. Then they would learn the real mm -hmm. discipline of life. Absolutely. You know, work ethics has, must come first. Yes. You know, that's a bad problem we have in this country. Yes. The work ethics by a lot of people, you know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it's unfortunate. Leaves a lot to be desired, yeah. And, uh, you know, one thing I did after I came here, came back home here, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I had the bottled water factory go in, you know, mm -hmm. all of the young people that came out of prison, mm -hmm. I tried to give them an opportunity because mm -hmm. I believe in helping anyone, no matter mm -hmm. what, you're young, you make mistakes, you can uh, reform yourself. Yes. And although many of them, once they got the first paycheck, I never seen them again. Mm -hmm. But hey, I gave them an opportunity to get mm -hmm. going. No matter what, I think it was good to have a lot of those young people. Mm -hmm. And you know, when they came to me, I explained to them, hey, it's going to be this way, this way, this way, that's it. Mm -hmm. If you don't do these things, mm -hmm. you fire yourself. I'm not mm -hmm. going to fire you. And mm -hmm. hey, a few of them, they came back and thanked me afterwards. Hey, I'm glad that you fired me, you know. But mm -hmm. I said, no, I didn't fire you. You fired yourself. Right. But I gave you the rules to run by. And you didn't do it. You didn't do it, so. 
Yes. If everyone ran business like that in this country, <laughs> you wouldn't have any problems, you mm. know. In the diesel business, most people I had working with me with, with me for over 20 years, you wow. know. Mm -hmm. Very good. Wow. So, um, you know, Volunteerism Heroes Day was just um, yesterday, in fact, and we celebrated um, volunteerism. You talk about the fact that you volunteer with a number of entities. So let's talk a little bit about that, because although you're retired, it's still important uh, for you to give back to the community. So I know that you're an active member of the Seafarers Association. Why, in your mind, is the Seafarers Association so important? The Seafarers Association, you know, hey, we have to keep alive where we came from in this country. You know, it, it, it's falling by the wayside. But uh, that's why now we have accepted the children and mm -hmm. grandchildren of seafarers into our association. Mm -hmm. Because, hey, last year we lost, between seafarers and widows, we lost, you know, almost 50 members. Wow. So we were a dying breed. Mm -hmm. And at 74, I'm one of the younger guys in the association. Mm -hmm. So we need new life to keep things alive, uh, you know, when we pass on. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we help those that really need it in the community. That Because uh, not everyone was sailing as a chief engineer or a captain or something. And they didn't save a whole lot. So we try to help out where we can. Mm -hmm. And by doing that and cooperating with government, you know, government has been very gracious to to the seafarers by giving them a monthly stipend, which we're not entitled to. It's that the grace of the government, they can stop it in the time they want. Mm -hmm. And also we have great health insurance coverage locally. So, you know, it's, uh, we want to encourage, there's a lot of seafarers out there, there that's still not a member of association but we like to encourage all of you to come join us mm -hmm. in the association mm -hmm. and the adult children of seafarers hey come on and help us out you can volunteer whatever there's mm -hmm. no benefits but hey it costs 50 bucks a year so no big deal and uh we love to have all of you that uh, can come and join us so mm -hmm. that we can keep the association alive. Yes. So, so how my father, Yurik, was a seaman, I could come now and actually join this association. Of course, oh, certainly. Wow. And like you say, thing. only $50 a year. That's and good. your dad, Yurik, was a good friend of mine you know oh yeah <laughs> yeah certainly he's a yeah. good friend of mine yeah we, we used to, to drive trucks at the same time when i was a youngster okay yeah he was a mechanic yeah <laughs> he was into that life so very very interesting and it's so interesting too that um, you know, you talked about your sort of love of like uh, machinery and fixing things. And then that ex extended to when you went to ship, uh, becoming engineers and you still very hands on with a lot of, you know, components on the on the various sh ships. And then some people came back and continued to either be engineers of some sort or starting, starting up their own, you know, mechanic shops and other stuff. So it's these skills that you learn probably quite early in life or when you're younger that will transition and carry you throughout, really. No doubt about it. And going at sea, if you don't have something, you have to make it. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, you live 100 years ashore, you won't mm -hmm. learn what you learn 10 years at sea. Mm -hmm. Because out there, you know, hey, you're out at sea, be a month before you see port again, something goes wrong, mm -hmm. you have to fix it. Like I say, you don't have it, you got to make it. Mm -hmm. But you got a complete machine shop and everything aboard ship that and all materials to work, whatever you need. Hey, and you, yes. you learn some everything, you know, mm -hmm. as, as an engineer, you got to have uh, engineering, electricity, refrigeration, uh, whatever, you know, it's uh, 
somewhere everything that you ever think about the shore, you, you have board ship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Amazing. Well, um, Mr. Andrew, we appreciate you taking some time out of your day to spend with us. I know our audience members are going to really love your insights today and you sharing a part of your, your life and your history. And I mean, it's just fascinating and so amazing. You got so many certificates. We'll see everything that's uh, that's up on display um, here behind him. But I feel like you come in here and this is um, such a big part of your life. But um, if you had to sort of assess and, and look back on where you are now, um, what what would you want people to really remember you for, you think? Oh, well, I don't think about someone remembering me for anything. For anything, yeah. <laughs> I I am someone, you know, for instance, now I've been 44 years in the Lions Club of Grand yes. Cayman. I have been, yeah. even long before that, when I came home from Sea of Aim, I was just a couple of weeks, I just mm -hmm. went around helping people yes. all over the island. Yep. And uh, I just want to uh, encourage people mm -hmm. to think about and do some of the things that I can join, join some organization, you know, mm -hmm. like Lions or whatever, also a member of the Justice of the Peace. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of clubs out there. I used to be uh, in the Red Cross for many years, but mm -hmm. uh, it got too hectic that uh, I couldn't keep up with everything, so I had to fall back a little bit from some of the things. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's lots of things out there. We can help others in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I encourage everyone who is not a member of some organization, hey, join up and uh, come help others. It's, yes. it's one of the most uh, best feelings you can have yeah, is helping other members of, of our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very satisfying. Yeah. I didn't realize um, over 40 years as, as Lions, as a Lions member? Yeah, 44 wow. years this year. Wow, that's quite amazing. Well, thank you um, so much uh, for speaking with us. Now, you've got some, some pins on you. Can you tell me a little bit about what some of those are? Your little... Um, oh, well, merits. this one I just got yesterday. Oh, that's the one from yeah, yesterday. Beautiful. Being a member of a wallet hair yes. organization. Beautiful. Uh, I got... Uh, this one is my Justice of Peace pin. Okay. And... Uh, I got my lion's pen and my seafarer's pen. Nice, then I, gorgeous. Th these are the two awards of what I got from uh, f from my seafaring days, you yes. know. And uh, th this one originally from the government and uh, mm -hmm. others, which actually you might know the, the uh, Southwell years that was done by Consuelo E. Banks. Mm -hmm. She was really the the, the headlines of getting this mm -hmm. this for us uh, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And then the final one was uh, what I got during Heroes Day uh, in mm -hmm. 2021. Mm -hmm. So I'm Beautiful. thankful. But hey, we don't do things for what we can get to show. No, but absolutely. Hey, it's things that fall by the wayside as we go along. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, but it's it's good to be recognized for all of your volunteerism and, and just hard work. Um, so, yeah, this has been an amazing interview. We're going to get some little footage. Are you able to do anything on the ham radio today that I can record? Like, can you message anyone or anything? Well, we we'll, can ship we'll and find see. someone to talk okay. to. Usually, right. I, I do digi <laughs> only digital these days, but uh, okay. we can uh, take a look. All right, folks. So, again, thank you so much to uh, Mr. Andrew Eden. Thank you. My pleasure. Pump is it? That's a motor for one of the pumps. Wow. <laughs> you see, that's motor for 500 horsepower. Wow. It's uh, and they got a lot of quite a few pictures of a white border ship, oh, you know, yeah. and nice. different ships, you know. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Uh, let's see. All right. Yep.
Sometimes you can hear both sides of kind of the deal sound at other times, so not all is. That is someone that call it me. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> and I go and I send him a report, and he come back acknowledging that. Uh -huh. And then uh, I'll just have the feeling I'll log it. I'll be log everything that you do. Right. This, yes. is, this is my logbook now. Okay. Wow. Very well organized. This one, this one in the U.S. I hope they will lock in. Uh -huh. And now there's a guy in Sweden that's calling me. Huh. Uh -huh. And I'm only running about 40 watts there now. Uh -huh. It's amazing how little power you can come in and hit all over the world. You know? Although we can run up to 1,500 watts with what we have. Uh -huh. But with the antennas I have, they're so great that... Uh, you know, I, got, I acknowledge the guy in Sweden. I'll uh -huh. send him a report, you see. Or he'll come back to me. You know? Right. Wow. And I can stay here all day now. They'll be, they'll be calling me nonstop. Yes. Stop, you know? Wow. Huh. And, uh, you know, we log them. And uh, what do you do? We send what we call QSL cards. You uh -huh. know, that. Uh, to acknowledge the contacts and all that, but a lot of it we do online these days. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, you see this guy, he didn't hear me when I went back to him, so uh -huh. I thought I'm sending him a report again. Again, right. Uh, uh -huh. This is a digital mode we call FT8. We have many different modes. Mm -hmm. uh, you see now he got it this time. Mm -hmm. right? He get me a send me a report five years minus zero seven. Mm -hmm. And then you see all reports go in here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it got the name and then I want to say country and all that. So. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. It hobby, is. You know, it's, it is very. Um, you know, you don't need what I have to come in right. here. You know, you get get a little piece of money, you can do it. But like any other hobby, you really uh, get into it. <laughs> yeah, this this guy now that this team I'm calling, you know, he's in Germany. In uh, Germany, wow. They cover the whole world easily. Yes. You know, very little problem. You know, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. hmm. It really is fascinating. Then I got my driver's license, I was only 16, although it had to be 17 to get it back then. And I went there, no, forget it, out in front of the old police station. Uh, car, car door 
looking like a lot of time. She was to walk in the police station and then, but you say, he not no 17, you know. <laughs> He's not no 17. That's what you're saying to the, the inspector that go and take me over to the driving test, you uh -huh. know. And, uh, and she said he'd go in a big old truck. I never go in a big old <laughs> truck to get my license, you know. Yes. Um, hey, well, that was it. He was there, took me for the exam. Hey, he took me all around your son, all over back and forth. God knows how many times. <laughs> the Sherwood was the chief of police back then, the English one. Uh -huh. And she would ask him, but no, but that's it, you know, they go in the license. Uh -huh. then, yeah, but he won the best driver that would took out my life. We see, I would drive him now with nine years old. Right, right, right. So. So they, had, they issued you your license. I had a lie. I had a lie at the age to get the license, but uh, hey, yes. I got it. Mm -hmm. That was his wife, she was from Trinidad. Yeah. And this is the radio operator's wife, she was Philippine. The cow wasn't really dead, but before he went ahead, the first thing he did was cut off the head and cut the throat with a knife. I was remembering when we went to Cape Town, uh, the uh, captain and his wife, they got off to go home. And, you know, she was from Trinidad, so she was colored. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't let them stay in the same hotel. Wow. They had to go to two different hotels because they had an overnight there, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, my oh, goodness. Oh, my wow. God. That place was awesome. Oh, my goodness. Mm. Yeah, you wouldn't believe how bad it was. I see, you know, a, a footbridge going over the, uh, the railroad tracks. One mm -hmm. side is white, one side is non-white. You go on both sides and by stop, one side is white, one side non-white. You know? okay. And not only that, but you got blondes, uh -huh. the Africans, that they were considered color, I mean, Completely, blonde hair, white as milk, you know, oh my god, how they came up with all these things, oh my god knows. But you know, the U.S. of the same way, I see up until 1970, I in Mobile, Alabama, we sit down inside the bar and just inside the door, there's a machine selling cigarettes, but uh -huh. they distribute cigarettes, you know. Uh -huh, uh -huh. This colored guy come in the door to um, get a pack of cigarettes. The uh -huh. woman, she rushed behind the door, kick him out of the place, same time. Wow. He said, the whole boy in the war, you do some, some of this members only, all the white people supposed to come in here. That's 1970. Uh -huh. you know? Things we saw out there, and it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. Of course, Cayman was like that, so that must have been a real eye opener for you. Yeah, you know. Oh my. Well, you know, I knew what they were saying before yeah. I got these places, but right. still, you see it, especially South Africa. You just can't believe how mm -hmm. bad that was. You know? Yeah, keep you here talking all day. <laughs> yeah, once you get on there, uh, we're sort of, not really rare, but you know, we're yes. the ex for them, so everybody want to make a contact with the Cayman Islands, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And nice. Aunt Jemima, go tell your mama, cock knock on a bone. 
Aunt Jemima, go tell your mama, come now, go no bone. Aunt Jemima, go tell your mama, come now, go no bone. Aunt Jemima, go tell your mama, come now, go no bone. Come now, go no bone. He was, a, he was a captain, he was a Dutch man. Mm -hmm. That was his wife, she was from Trinidad. Mm -hmm. And this is a radio operator's wife, she was Philippine. Mm -hmm. Trinidad, so she was colored, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't let them stay in the same hotel. Wow. They had to go to two different hotels because they had an overnight there, you know. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, my wow. that too oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you wouldn't believe how bad it was. I see, you know, a, a footbridge going out where they are. Um, the, Railroad tracks. One mm -hmm. side is white. One side is non-white. You go on the both sides. You buy stops. One side is white. One side non-white. Oh you know. Oh, yeah. And not only that, but you got blondes. Uh huh. The Africans that they were considered color. I mean, completely. Didn't make Blonde any sense. hair, white as milk. You know. Oh my God. Mm -mm. How they came up with all these things? Only God knows. Mm -mm. Unbelievable. But you know, the U.S. was the same way. I see up until 1970 in Mobile, Alabama. Mm -hmm. We're sitting out inside the bar, and just inside the door, there's a machine selling cigarettes. We mm -hmm. sell cig distribute cigarettes, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This colored guy come in the door to um, get a pack of cigarettes. The mm -hmm. woman, she rushed behind the door, kick him out of the place at the same time. Wow. He said the whole way in the world, you do some, some of this members only, all the white people supposed to come in here. That's wow. 1970. Yeah. You know, things we saw out there, and it was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I can imagine. Mm -mm. And of course, Cayman wasn't like that, so that must have been a real eye opener for you. Yeah, you know, oh my. Well, you know, I knew of those things before yeah. I got these places, but right. still, you see it, especially in South Africa. You just can't believe how mm -hmm. bad that was. You know? mm -hmm. Oh, I can't. Uh, I can't bother. Anymore, yeah, keep you here know? talking all day. Yeah, once you get on there, <laughs> and we're sort of not really rare, but you know, we're yes. like the X for them, so everybody want to make a contact with the Cayman Islands, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, Nice. I can see the willows waving on your southern shores As the breeze it gently whispers through the trees And the song I hear you singing floats across the distant shore And it seems to say, my child, come back to me Come back home, come back home to your island for I long to see you walk upon my sand For my shores they belong to my children And my children belong to Grand Cayman Come back home, come back home to your island For I long to see you walk upon my sand For my shores they belong my children and my children belong to Grand Cayman. I can smell the salty air upon your harbor as the northwest winds they blow across the sea. 
And I see the foaming white caps as they break against your shores. Like a distant drum, I hear them call to me. Come back home, come back home to your Hello, I'm Kevin Watler, and this is your CMR Daily Buzz. Here's a summary of some of Cayman's latest headlines. As Makiba Bush recovers from his recent health scare, the Royal Cayman Islands Police Service has indicated that two criminal investigations against him are progressing and interviews have been scheduled. Vendors operating illegally on Crown land have been ordered to cease and desist or face prosecution as of February 1st. The Public Lands Commission Inspectorate is reminding the public that it is a criminal offense to conduct commercial activities on Crown land without vendors permit issued by the Public Lands Commission. In an effort to ensure that evidence-based parenting information and strategies are more readily available to all parents within the community, the Family Resource Center has launched a free telehealth service for patients within all three islands. The 10th annual Cayman Islands Meals on Wheels Change for Change donation drive will see hundreds of volunteers stationed around Grand Cayman until Saturday collecting coins, cash and donations of any amount for Meals on Wheels. Now for your CMR weather update, it's brought to you by WG Charters. Sunrise just after 7, partly cloudy skies are expected when the temperature is at 83 degrees Fahrenheit and the humidity at 70% like the forecast calls for, it will feel like it's in the mid to high 80s. Winds northeast at 10 to 20 miles per hour and the sun sets at 615. At nighttime, the temperature falls to the mid 70s. Looking forward, similar weather conditions are expected. If you would like to know more on any of these stories, visit caymanmallroad.com or follow Cayman Mall Road on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. That's it for now on The Daily Buzz. Thank you for joining me. Please stay safe and God bless.